everybody. Welcome to the third day of the International Conference on Disinformation and Memory Politics. Such a re relevant and timely uh, topic, as we have heard uh, the first two days. Now we'll start with the fifth panel, which is still very, very interesting. It will be focused on uh, international and European strategies to combat uh, disinformation. This panel will be moderated by uh, Dr. Bartosz Dzienawowski Stefanski, I, and myself. A few words for uh, Dr. Bartosz. Very vast experience uh, as researcher, both in European Network uh, of Remembrance and Solidarity and in Institute of History of Polish Academy of Science. He's also Deputy Director of Research Department and Institute of European History published author, very honored to moderate this session with you. Myself, few words. I'm introducing myself as a chair of the Authority for Information uh, on Secret Service Sigurimi, uh, called in Albania, uh, of the dictatorship. I've been myself always uh, doing many things, but always an activist uh, going after the redressing policies and making sure that Human rights uh, violation of the past gets, you know, compensated or gets, you know, fixed as much as we can today. Um, let me uh, introduce the first speaker to this panel. It will be Dr. Mikhail Zantowski, this Czech diplomat, politician, uh, published author, uh, psychologist, and lyricist. Many things. Welcome, Mr. Michael, uh, Mikhail Zantowski. We want to really pretty much hear what you have to say on the distinction between fake news and disinformation. And uh, are they the same thing? We're all years to, to listen to you. But before we start the panel, let me, uh, two, three words. Every speaker has only 20 minutes to present. The areas are vast and, you know, the focus is, is broad, but we need to make sure that these 20 minutes will be uh, met. Uh, that will be, uh, there will be also question and answers at the end, which will be moderated by my colleague in this uh, panel moderation, uh, Dr. Bartosz. Dr. Mikhail Zantowski, floor is yours. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I will be taking a, a little more detached perspective of uh, our topic this morning, I'm not a historian like most of you are. I'm a social scientist uh, in one way or another. So this will be my perspective. And I also apologize, I'm, uh, as some of us are these days, I'm chronologically challenged, as they say politically correctly. So I... I, I will try to, to operate the share screen feature, but if I, if I can't, uh, please, uh, uh, please uh, uh, excuse me. Okay, so this is our conference. Uh, this is the title of my uh, uh, talk, and I will start with... Uh, uh, the structure of my uh, paper, uh, I hope you can, you can see it and I will delve uh, straight in and start with what I call the information paradox. And uh, uh, that is, uh, in my view, an indisputable fact. Most of the information we encounter in our lives is wrong or incomplete, sometimes intentionally, but most often as a result of misunderstanding, misperception, flawed sources, imprecision, or simply insufficient knowledge. And large part of the rest is not necessarily the result of a deliberate effort to misinform, but it is a result of our subjectivity, projection of our prejudices, or a half-conscious effort to embellish, prettify, simplify, or moderate the truth. The world, so to speak, is full of fake news. They were not invented with social media or the internet. They existed since uh, uh, time 
uh, immemorial. And in the first graph, I tried to uh, illustrate uh, uh, the paradox, uh, the don't mind the percentages. I mean, of course, they are uh, very rough approximations, but uh, I think it still remains the truth that uh, the truth uh, consists of only a small sliver of the vast body of information we encounter every day. The fake news of a geocentric space, flat earth and luminiferous ether endure centuries before being replaced by the heliocentric system, earth as a spheroid and wave theory. Misinformation has many parents, truth is an orphan. The most fertile ground for the origin and the spread of fake news is one we know nothing or little about. And uh, as I try to show you, ancient cartographers mark the limits of their maps and of their knowledge with uh, uh, Hicksund Leones. Here are the lions or Hicksund Dracones. Here are the dragons and they were apparently not quite sure uh, which uh, of the two, so I put, uh, I put uh, in both. Our concern here is with the small part of uh, flawed information that is fabricated and disseminated purposefully for political, commercial or personal aims. When someone says, after being vaccinated with AstraZeneca, you grow horns, it's either fake news or a psychiatric symptom. When the same someone has also invested in Johnson & Johnson, it is disinformation. It follows then that one cannot distinguish between fake news and disinformation without inquiring into the motivation of its originators. And you cannot inquire into the motivation of the originators without knowing who they are. So another area where false information is being spread intentionally is propaganda. The difference between propaganda and disinformation is largely a matter of degree and of the source. Most states, even democratic states, political parties and commercial organizations engage in propaganda, although in a democracy they are trying to limit themselves to spinning, augmenting or reframing true information for fear of being caught in a lie. The harm done by propaganda to a true perception of the world and its events, significant though it is, is moderated by our knowledge of its authors, perpetrators and their aims. You do not expect Kim Jong-un to say that his country is a pathetic, starving concentration camp you expect him to say it is a glorious paradise of the working class and discount it as propaganda. In this part of the world, the, as I said, the chronologically challenged among us had been exposed to systematic propaganda for half of their lives and are conscious both of its dangers and of the relative ease of recognizing it and subverting it. But then there is this information, this information, a much more devious and dangerous phenomenon, which is the real subject of our debate today. It aims at falsifying, uh, obscuring, confusing or concealing the truth. Uh, and they can only be fully achieved if the perpetrators and their true aims stay obscured. If someone reveals that the COVID-19 vaccines are an instrument of mind control over citizens by a global conspiracy from the top of a shoebox at Hyde Park Corner, they are not likely to be taken very seriously. This is the top of a shoebox on the Hyde Park Corner. If they manage to disseminate the same message through social media, they may do untold harm. The difference is not only or only secondarily in the vastly different scope of outreach between the two methods. Ultimately, it is the difference between seeing the author and being able to assess 
his credibility and his intentions or being in the dark about the source. For this information to work, its source must stay hidden or be esoteric enough as to be untraceable or at least deniable. If uh, GRU says that Sergei Skripal regularly used Novichok as a psychotropic drug, does not work. Nor does Putin says that Navalny is a pedophile. But invent an appropriate server name like uh, revelations.com and post the same information there with a share link and you will see what happens. The distinction between flawed or fake news and disinformation has acquired an unprecedented relevance in the contemporary society where vast amounts of information and data are disseminated electronically every millisecond, some of them true, most of them somewhat wrong, and some of them intentionally false. On the one hand, we see an enormous growth of fake news and disinformation. On the other, uh, we see the growth of measures to protect privacy against the theft and misuse of information. But in reality, and this is one of the points I want to make today, these two phenomena are not contradictory, but complement and reinforce each other. As government think tanks and ordinary people become aware of the scope and the seriousness of the disinformation threat, the question of strategies to combat disinformation becomes of paramount uh, importance. And uh, I would uh, propose that uh, the first and most powerful weapon against disinformation, if I can move this slide a little further. Uh, 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 okay. Okay. Is facts, facts, and again, facts. There are enough data and facts documenting the horrific story of the Holocaust or the crimes of communism to defeat even the most determined conspiracy theories. The facts themselves, however, are not enough without education, without the educational system internalizing them and passing them on to their students. Education is a way of weaponizing facts. In weaponizing facts, however, we must be careful not to put too much uh, role and responsibility on the governments, which mm -hmm. have a natural propensity to filter and prioritize some facts over others. The integrity of the process from peer-reviewed scholarship through independent universities to school emphasizing critical thinking is of a sense if we are to avoid the perception of two sets of untruths fighting each other. Regulatory solutions are the tools of last resort in fighting disinformation. Even in the United States, with the almost unlimited First Amendment concept of the freedom of speech, regulatory concepts emerge to disallow hate speech, racism, political incorrectness, and other evils, uh, largely drawing on the Supreme Justice's Oliver Wendell Holmes land and contested opinion that I quote, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Unquote. But we should keep in mind that this Supreme Court verdict was contingent on a particular expression of free speech representing, and I again quote, clear and present danger to the society. And judging from some of the recent developments, it would seem that the theater gets ever more crowded and that the clear and present danger is everywhere. Some of the leading social media companies now take it on themselves to ban or suspend the disseminators of fake news and disinformation. In the view of this author, the result of this experiment so far are not very encouraging for several reasons. First, at any given moment, there exists a vastly bigger amount of false information 
about the method than true information. To decide which false information is more seriously false, which represents a clear and present danger than the others, requires expertise, it's time consuming, and in the end, impractical, in spite of the some widely publicized examples like uh, the tweet Donald Trump. Second, without going into a philosophical discussion, truth is an elusive concept with shades and degrees, contexts, semantic subtleties, and subjective perspectives. In general, we are tolerant of a certain degree of imprecision or falsity until it becomes too striking. And again, who decides? And last, free societies are hindered in fighting disinformation by their own commitments to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Imposing limits on free speech in the name of security, political correctness, or social harmony should always be the instrument of last resort and subject to thorough constitutional and legislative scrutiny. Giving into the temptation. Excuse yes. me, three more minutes. Okay, well, giving <laughs> into the temptation to cut free speech to protect from disinformation could be fighting the disinformance battle. Their tactical goal may be to obscure the truth from prevailing. Their strategic goal, however, is to undermine the idea of a free society itself. There is, in the opinion of this writer, another more effective way to reduce if not to eliminate the damage done to a free society by disinformation. It is five minutes, sorry, sorry. It is five minutes. Oh, you know, I always had a heart attack. <laughs> it is to re-examine and overhaul the concept of privacy, another tenet of our uh, societies that makes uh, uh, the fight against disinformation difficult or impossible. In one of the first normative attempts, by Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis, privacy was defined as the right to be let alone. Throughout history, privacy has been related to the house, to family life, to personal communication, also to one's body. Together, they comprise the private sphere, which should be protected against intrusion. As the various ways to obtain, collect, and exploit data information about ourselves multiply, so do natural efforts to protect against other people doing it without our consent from the early formulations in the 1950 European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedom, which states in the Article 8, quote, everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence, through the 2016 General Data Protection Regulation, the infamous GDPR, including my favorite right to be forgotten in its Article 17. The justification of this right by its authors, as some of you know, as a way to enable individuals to, quote, determine the development of their life in an autonomous way without being perpetually or periodically stigmatized as a consequence of a specific action performed in the past, unquote, speaks directly to the efforts to document and preserve the past by memory institutions and by others. Uh, in my view, it is perfectly unacceptable. Measures like that basically assume that privacy covers everything that is not explicitly made public. But that may be an overly broad definition. Uh, Vinton Seff, one of the founders of the internet, told the gathering of the Federal Trade Commission in 2013 that privacy may actually be an anomaly. And he must have known what he's talking about. In fact, the private sphere is just part of our living space and a rather small one at that. The other more pertinent to this discussion is the public sphere, as well as the interface between the two. The public sphere is just as essential as privacy for the healthy life of an individual and the society. The moment we leave our privacy, we leave our house, we enter the public sphere where the emphasis is not on staying in anonymous, but on being recognized. Until quite recently, the safety, the well-being, and the mutual trust of our ancestors depended on knowing who their neighbors are. Strangers, masked people, veiled individuals, invariably represented a threat and were often confronted as such. As long as we stay within the castle of our house, our identity is protected. 
the moment we enter the public sphere, whether physically or on the internet, we share it with others. In declaring our identity, we also declare our public record in the past, our present position, and our motives and intentions for the future. As Warren and Brandeis wrote, the right to privacy ceases upon the publication of the facts by the individual. Our actions, deeds, and proclamations made it in public are no longer our own to be claimed back and reprivatized at our leisure as the right to be forgotten would have it, but remain forever a part of the social space. They are a part of universal memory. Most of the disinformation and fake news today occur in the virtual space of the internet. This is by definition a part of the public sphere. Yet many of the perpetrators of this information hide behind cutouts, nicknames, obscure websites and other devices to protect their anonymity. They represent a threat because there is no way to gauge their identity, their sources, their record and their intentions. It doesn't make much sense when we go to a bank or channel our financial resources in other ways. We are ot automatically subject to several layers of proving our identity to establish the necessary level of trust for the transaction. For similar reasons, we should treat information in the same way. Information is the currency of our age. We sell it and buy it, borrow it, steal it, deposit and invest it. Yet, when we post it on the internet, no one bothers to ask whether we are who we say we are. So, if finally, I'm reaching the conclusion. If we are to curb the spread of fake news and disinformation, we will have to address the issue of privacy first and foremost. There are two ways to do it. The first is regulation and coercion. It should be possible to block the gateway to the internet to anyone unable to prove her or his identity an electronic ID is a perfectly technically feasible solution. But let's admit that any attempt to make the self-identification on the internet and in the social media mandatory will encounter regulatory, legal, human rights and commercial obstacles and resistance that may be impossible to surmount. So this leaves us with the last possibility, which is divesting from the internet of the shadows, as I call it, and creating an internet of the real people. Uh, yeah, this is the internet of the shadows and this is the internet of the real people. A distinct social network of a group of such networks whose use would be contingent on proving a real individual and unmistakable identity. Any user of such a network would thus disclose his identity to all the others and their identity would be transparent to him. As for the rest, the news fakers, the conspiracy theorists, the secret service agents, the hidden advertisers and the agenda mongers, they would continue to be free to spread their poison lies and propaganda with all the way their lack of identity would carry. So I will finish with a quote. The question is simply whether we are all capable to ultimately bear the responsibility for our words, whether we are really and unreservedly able to vouch for ourselves. This is what Václav Havel said more than 50 years ago. Apparently, some people are not ready to do that. The question then is why we should keep communicating with them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Zantowski. Your presentation was so useful and very interesting. Uh, indeed, we got to understand how you put it two ways to control, so to say, that the spread of fake news, one being more on the restrictive, the coercion side, and the other one more on the educating, uh, empowering the sources, good sources and everything, and, you know, not relying too much on the censoring because we in our countries have seen this not working well, but rather strengthening the, the, the truth mechanism and instruments to make sure that our private space is secured and also public space is, you know, with the proper truth being spread. Now I uh, would like to invite a colleague, uh, a researcher, a historian, an activist. Uh, it's Dr. Lukasz Kaminski. Hi, uh, Mr. Lukasz. It's, I'm very glad to see you. Uh, Mr. Lucas is a PhD, it's a historian. He's specialized in history of communism and anti-communist resistance. He's been heading the homologue of 
institution like I'm doing now in Albania and me myself, I have a great uh, uh, praise of the work he's been done in the Polish Institute of Remembrance. Really, you know, I, I commend that personally. I've seen we are going after your traces. Uh, also now he's uh, the head of the platform, platform for European Memory and Conscious, another uh, very good actor in uh, no, not only calling it onto the national narrative of communist and dictatorship and uh, opposition, but, you know, uh, try to make it more cross-national because uh, this is how it came. <laughs> so this is how we need to kind of, you know, uh, make sure that this is never uh, going to happen again, in, 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 at least in the same form and shape. Uh, Mr. Lukasz Kaminski will uh, speak about how history can prevent disinformation. Mr. Kaminski, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction and uh, for inviting me to this uh, very important and interesting um, conference. Um, <laughs> Uh, during uh, uh, the first uh, uh, sessions or first days of, of our conference, I realized that uh, mm, probably I should look for another wording um, uh, in the title of, uh, of my presentation because I think there is uh, no discussion on the issue that in fact we cannot prevent um, uh, disinformation. You know, it's a kind of let's say, natural phenomenon, uh, which was with us for centuries, but now, of course, is much more uh, visible. Uh, so, um, uh, probably uh, I should uh, use the word like limit, uh, that in this information, what we can do as historians to limit uh, this information, uh, especially in the field of uh, uh, memory. Uh, memory politics, um, etc. But anyway, the main goal of my presentation um, of today is uh, uh, not to uh, put in too much to, to, to our uh, general debate, but rather uh, to present the ENRS uh, project on, on disinformation, ongoing project on uh, disinformation. But I will start with some uh, general and probably very obvious um, uh, remarks. So, uh, I think there is a need um, uh, for another debate uh, on definitions and uh, uh, differences between uh, such notions like, for example, fake news and uh, mistakes, because the basic definition of fake news is uh, just uh, untrue information, and we know that uh, uh, probably all of us made uh, mistakes as, uh, as historians or social scientists, it's quite natural, uh, it's quite human. Uh, so when the fake news uh, in history starts, you know, where is the end of, um, let's say, some amount of national, natural mistakes, and uh, when we can speak about them, um, uh, the fake news, and probably more important um, a question, what are the differences, uh, especially in the context of the title of our con conference, the problem of uh, uh, historical memory, uh, uh, collective memory, etc. Uh, what is the difference between, uh, or where is the border between disinformation campaign and uh, natural historical disputes or even conflicts of memory, some contradictory interpretations of uh, the same events, etc, etc. I think uh, we should one day also discuss uh, this issue because uh, uh, I think that uh, nowadays we sometimes just use in such uh, debates um, uh, those notions of fake news or disinformation as an insult. Yeah, someone is, uh, for example, interpreting in different way the same event. So the easiest way to contradict is to say, no, no it's a, just a disinformation, a fake news. Do not listen to him or to this group, to this nation, to this state. Um, so uh, maybe one day we, we could meet once again and, and discuss uh, those borders because probably they are not very clear. And, and uh, I think that Michael Jantowski is right uh, when, he, when he said that motivation is probably crucial. Yeah? So that the purpose why uh, we conduct some campaign, for example, or, or, or etc. So it's, it's, it's a problem of 
uh, of motivation uh, of the roots of, uh, for example, the, the, the mistake. Is it natural mistake or planned fake news to promote uh, some, uh, some ideas? So uh, what, what we can do as, um, as historians, and of course, uh, first thing is uh, do not participate in spread, not only spreading, but uh, fabricating fake news and preparing the disinformation propaganda. And my um, short overview is that the uh, uh, situation is quite good, I think, that uh, uh, historians are, are quite rarely uh, openly uh, involved in this formation. Of course, uh, probably some disinformation campaigns in the fields of memory uh, and history are planned with uh, some participation of professional historians, uh, uh, especially if we are speaking about the secret services uh, activities, but it's uh, still not public and it's a good news. Uh, we can compare, for example, with the current situation um, and uh, pandemic situation uh, uh, in which many uh, doctors, including professors of medicine, are involved in uh, disinformation about vaccines, uh, other uh, tools to prevent uh, spreading pandemic. So, which is completely contradictory to the, you know, to the knowledge, uh, medical knowledge on virusology, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, as I said, it's a good, uh, to a good situation, but uh, I observe quite big amount of passive involvement uh, of, of historians in social media, uh, for example, sharing posts which can be classified as fake news or disinformation. And uh, it's especially when someone is a specialist, uh, for example, in Middle Ages, and is sharing some posts on contemporary history or 19th century history. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we can observe it on, on daily on daily basis. But I would like to ask one more question about the silent complicity. If there is a kind of disinformation campaign regarding history and historians know the sources which are uh, important in this issue and could uh, the, the mask uh, this disinformation and very uh, still are. Uh, silent. Uh, the second uh, thing we, we can do as historians is of course counteract. Uh, uh, during the first day uh, of the conference already the question is there is a sense in you know writing uh, and signing protests, some public statements, is there is a sense in such an activity? I am not so sure in, to, to, that in contemporary world you know, some manifestos uh, written by historians could play any crucial role. I rather believe uh, in our social responsibility and being active, for example, if the main tool of uh, disinformation right now uh, are the social media, we should be present uh, there, not only to share, you know, the photos from, from our holidays, uh, but also to comment uh, and to be an expert. And of course, I agree with uh, many speakers of our conference that uh, right now there is no hierarchy in spreading information, there are no gatekeepers, etc. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should give up as historians. We should at least try to counteract and uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to spread the truth, um, to use our knowledge uh, to show the public that, uh, for example, many uh, popular uh, theories on social networks are just not connected anyway with, with the real uh, historical, uh, historical um, uh, events. Uh, what's more, uh, we should share the, the knowledge and I am much more uh, optimistic, for example, than uh, Professor Bergman was uh, yesterday because I agree, of course, that this information will stay with us um, uh, forever. Uh, but, uh, of course, maybe it's just, you know old style of thinking. Uh, uh, I really believe that, uh, for example, the general historical knowledge could serve as a kind of vaccine. And, uh, uh, and uh, for example, people who are familiar with Holocaust history, even on very general level, I think they will be uh, immune uh, for uh, fake news or disinformation in this area. Of course, not all of them, but as we know, 
and depends on vaccine. Yeah, some uh, some of them are protecting us in 60 some percent, like Johnson and Johnson, and uh, uh, Pfizer is protecting society on the level of more than 19 percent. Yes, it's still not 100 percent. Doesn't mean that every person with historical knowledge will be immune uh, for uh, historical disinformation, uh, but. Uh, big part of them. And uh, I think this is the way how to achieve a kind of herd immunity uh, against historical disinformation. Yes, If we will have enough people in the society, including enough people among users of social networks uh, who have this general knowledge, uh, I think it can stop spreading. Yes, It will not prevent 100% of spreading disinformation, but uh, it, it can help uh, a lot. And of course, uh, uh, we should do uh, what we are doing, for example, during this conference, uh, uh, using past examples of this formation and to, uh, to show uh, on historical examples, what are the mechanisms of disinformation, fake news, um, et cetera. I think it's a, also quite good tool um, to, 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 to prevent spreading disinformation uh, in the society. But uh, we should also uh, not only share the, 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 the historical knowledge, but also share our skills. Uh, you can see here a quotation in the contemporary world, everyone should be a historian. And uh, I heard it from one of my students uh, when last semester I had a seminar of, on this information. It was a, a general course of, on the place of historians in digital world. Um, uh, and one of the seminars was de devoted directly to this information. It was uh, the last comment from, from one of my students. And I think saying, uh, and it's saying a lot because, uh, and of course, Dr. Brakeston yesterday's uh, survey uh, presented uh, made me less optimistic in, in, in this because um, uh, according to this uh, uh, survey, that like 60% of historians only were, were able to uh, properly interpret uh, the internet sources, which is a bad result, but still, it was much better than other groups. Uh, so I believe that uh, our basic skills like source critics and uh, various ways of verification of information are crucial, not only in the context of historical fake news or historical disinformation, but also in general, uh, that the people who will have those skills, who, who uh, will be able to ask the basic uh, questions, historians ask the source, who is the author? What was the purpose? Yes, what is a hidden story behind the text, etc.? They will be prepared for the modern world and they will have uh, uh, important skills uh, to uh, debunk um, uh, disinformation, to recognize uh, the, fake, um, uh, the fake news. And this way of, of thinking was uh, um, the, the source of the ENRS project, No to Disinformation, which is uh, uh, which was and still is partially prepared by international inter interdisciplinary team, but majority of the members of the team are, are historians. So it's somehow fitting to my general topic on, 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 on historians. The main target group uh, are high school students and teachers, uh, but I believe that, uh, and I tested it on my own students, university students, it, it can work also. Uh, for university uh, university students, especially when we add, because it's still ongoing projects, some additional uh, materials at its, as, it's, uh, as it's planned. And this uh, project consists of uh, text written by various specialists, historians, but not only specialists, uh, educational materials um, uh, for, for teachers, uh, which are connected with majority of text, not all of them, uh, and a kind of guidebook um, for students um, how to uh, be safe in this digital world and how to recognize the fake news, disinformation, how to verify uh, uh, information, of course, in a context of um, history. But as I said before, those skills are universal. So if, if uh, someone will... Um, 
have those skills, get those skills from, from our project, uh, uh, it will be useful in uh, pandemic disinformation or others. So now I need to switch uh, uh, my screen. I will stop sharing uh, the presentation. And, uh, minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and just a short, uh, uh, short, uh, a presentation of this uh, project. So we start with a general history lessons web page prepared by ENRS. You can find a lot of uh, interesting material uh, here and on the right, we can choose no to disinformation um, uh, project. As, and as you can uh, as you can see, we have uh, right now various texts. There, will, there are still a few more coming. Um, some uh, uh, general historical texts, yes, how, for example, communist propaganda, Nazi propaganda in the field of history worked. Uh, we have a text about uh, negationism, historical negationism, which is also a, 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 a historical uh, experience, but we have a special, written by specialists attacks on as such phenomena like uh, deep fake, uh, filter bubbles, um, etc. Some experiences from, from the past and of course many of the participants of our conference uh, uh, were among the authors of those, um, of those uh, uh, texts, but uh, we have also some, um, some, some uh, text connected with uh, this uh, skills uh, of historians, yes, how to interpret documents, uh, general texts about verifying information. But also we have, uh, for example, two texts written by journalists from Poland and from Albania, how uh, journalists work in this, um, in, this, um, in this field. And in right now in some texts, but we are uh, working on it, uh, uh, there is a, also this additional educational material. Uh, I would like to show you on one example, but unfortunately, I don't know why uh, my internet right now is very slow, maybe because of this uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom connection. Uh, so for example, we have a general article written by a historian on, uh, on, on communist uh, propaganda in the context of, of historical uh, uh, this information, for example, with some interesting uh, images like this uh, famous letter from the edit editors of the Soviet en Encyclopedia who are sending uh, their uh, subscribers uh, new pages from one of the vol volume when, when Beria disappeared from the Soviet uh, history. Uh, but the teacher will find not only this general text, but uh, for example, uh, the, the lesson scenario, uh, some advices uh, how to conduct the lessons on similar topic using the, the text, using some source materials. There are also source materials uh, included, um, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole project is accompanied by a general kind of guidebook. Uh, how to recognize historical manipulation and fake news uh, uh, on the internet. Yes, we are focusing on on uh, on internet, uh, not only to show how popular right now this information is, especially in social media, but also to uh, give some advice uh, how to recognize it, uh, but also where to find the true information, what are the sources available, because uh, um, the internet and especially social media uh, are the reasons why this information is such a vivid issue in the contemporary world, but in the same time they can help us uh, with uh, finding the, the, the truth and to counteract against, uh, against the disinformation, um, so it's just 22 pages of such advises we of course using we are using some some examples like the famous deep fake with president obama yes which was created just to show how dangerous it is and i think it's another issue for historians another debate what to do with digital sources because we are prepared to 
um, to, to, to find the fake sources, you know, in medieval archives, etc. But we are completely not prepared as historians uh, how to uh, distinguish between the real digital sources and deep fakes. Yes, and uh, our methodology is not useful anymore in here. But fortunately, and you can learn it from one of the texts we publish on, uh, on the website, uh, there are some uh, met method methods, uh, methods uh, uh, in which, uh, for example, math, mathematics can help us. Uh, for example, to the bank. So this is my last, last, okay. last, last comment. We are finishing it with uh, some good advices for, for uh, good practices, advices uh, for, for students, but uh, I think those good practices like do not spread disinformation. If you did, it can happen to everyone, uh, write a post, uh, say sorry, but and say the truth about the, uh, the past event. I think those um, yeah. good practices are quite universal. So thank you very much uh, once, uh, once more for the invitation and I look forward for a discussion. Thanks very much, Mr. Lukas. Uh, presentation personally I found very interesting and I guess also the colleagues uh, did the same. Uh, of course, uh, we all face these new challenges with the sources and all the social media and internet and all this, but what struck me more was, you know, your, your appeal to share knowledge, share skills. Here, for example, in Albania, we have good historians, but they work on isolation. They have very good works, but their work is not spread. So, and they use these old format books that nobody can afford even to buy, or they print very few uh, copies because they do not have resources. And uh, people are eager to, to get this information, but not in these big books, but you know, in shorter messages and more illustrated version, let alone young people that really, they are in, you know, TikTok, they are on Instagram and all this. So. For example, in our institution, what we are trying to do, you know, to be useful in spreading uh, knowledge that is already being accumulated, and I guess, and also skills for the new generation. And it, it came very well, you know, with the first uh, Mr. Zantowski's idea that, yes, we need some regulation, but it shouldn't come always from the governments. We don't want to regulate fully politically the narratives but it should come through other, you know, building skills and sharing knowledge and sharing skills. So, you know, we face these new challenges of development. Now I'd like to invite uh, for the third presentation, our uh, colleague, Professor Florin Abraham. It's a Romanian uh, scholar, uh, associate professor in political science from the Romanian University of Public Administration and Political Sciences. He's also a senior researcher uh, from the Institute of uh, Studying uh, Totalitarianism in Romania. Romania has a lot to share on this uh, front. Mr. Floring is also a published author, internationalist. I congratulate him for his very interesting books, Amnesty and uh, others. He will share with us uh, in this conference a presentation on geopolitics of disinformation in the age of social media. Mr. Floring, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope uh, uh, anything it's okay. If you you can sh see it's my uh, share uh, okay. screen, I start uh, my presentation with. A we are two minutes uh, behind the schedule. I, yes, would, I, I think have we to have shorten. enough uh, time uh, until the middle so of the day, will. according to the Eastern time. So. Uh, I think uh, I, I start my presentation with a quotation from Sun Tzu, Art of War. Uh, All warfare is based on deception. What I choose uh, this quotation because my idea is that uh, the deception it was a constant in uh, history of human of humankind, but what are new in our times are new uh, instruments. And uh, we now, uh, uh, in so-called, in between, between the 20th century uh, uh, methods, uh, mass media system, and the new, uh, an emergence uh, uh, new system, and we need to understand how it use it uh, now. For, uh, I think it needed to. Uh, 
to create uh, a broader image uh, of the subject in order to understand that the spe specific topics uh, about uh, how uh, social media uh, was used for geopolitical purpose. In fact, uh, uh, in last uh, times, uh, was a merge so-called a subfield of subfield of popular geopolitics because uh, public opinions are important uh, for the democratic uh, regime, and also uh, popular geopolitics uh, uh, try to understand uh, what are the impact of the music uh, of the. Uh, movies uh, or other forms uh, of uh, arts on the public opinion. The second general observation is that uh, to study uh, this information international relation require a so-called a transdis transdisciplinary approach because uh, of course from history from, from history from political science from also uh, new fields communication studies and also from so welfare and intelligence studies. And it's very hard uh, to put together and to connect uh, methods, information, and people, skills uh, from uh, this uh, uh, civilian and military uh, uh, areas, scientific area. The main fact is that we are now on so-called the hybrid media, media system. And this uh, hybrid media system, it was a basic condition for the new type of warfare, hybrid warfare, that includes cyber attacks, cyber espionage, and so on. And the basic fact is that over 4 billion social media users now, over 42% uh, uh, of global population is connected through social media. The most uh, uh, enjoy uh, it was, of course, uh, uh, Facebook and uh, the Facebook uh, uh, count over uh, two point billion uh, users around the world. And the major breakthrough in our societies is that 99% access sites are through the mobile devices, not to the uh, desk, desktop, uh, but through uh, phones, mobile phones, uh, uh, laptops, or uh, tablets. And what is was astonishing that the average number of social media accounts is in Europe uh, 8.8 8 .8 per person in last year. So uh, uh, we, we have uh, many social uh, accounts, social media accounts. And the other uh, general observation and why, in fact, the, the question is why so uh, is social media uh, so uh, uh, easy for uh, use it on this, on this information? Because uh, messages reach individual faster and without control, in fact. It is very cheaper. It, it, it is the subject also of traditional weaponization of media, but also it was a new method from, that are coming from artificial intelligence. And uh, we speak uh, many times about uh, uh, internet, the boots, cyborgs, uh, methods of uh, artificial intelligence uh, put uh, on the welfare uh, uh, times. And the other problems is that establishing sources of this, of this information requires from many times non-civilians uh, resources, because uh, uh, as we see uh, uh, on the next, uh, just uh, secret services uh, have that knowledge and resources to find from where uh, uh, are uh, so-called boots, cyborgs, trolls, and, and so on. And uh, to combine civilian and military uh, resources are uh, relatively hard in a democratic societies. 
another topic, it is what are the, uh, the question, what are the areas of geopolitical co uh, competition on cyberspace? Because uh, it is a cyber, uh, comp it is a, a competition in, on uh, cyberspace. And the first important thing, it, it is the fact that we are on the situation of asymmetry between the great power regarding the access to internet. Because in Europe, United States, uh, North America, it was uh, freedom of access in the West and uh, the, the competing great powers uh, could uh, play uh, without rules. But also on the same time, uh, other great powers uh, use uh, a strict control uh, of the internet. And uh, uh, I think uh, everyone know about uh, great uh, uh, firewall. For example, uh, I remember that uh, I was uh, uh, in China on, on the moment uh, and uh, it was a debate uh, on CNN and, uh, about uh, uh, Tib Tibet uh, problem. And uh, uh, simply uh, the connection was uh, shut down uh, on, the, on the screen when uh, CNN debate uh, this subject. So uh, also these uh, mechanisms are used on, on the internet. But are different views, great powers uh, on the five, uh, on, on, the, on, on four uh, major problems. International regulation of the internet. You, United States, oppose regulation and promote the so-called multi-stakeholder uh, model. EU uh, are not uh, in the position to have, until now, to have uh, a clear message, but we'll uh, see uh, what will propose uh, Mr. Cesarini. And uh, on the same time, Ch uh, China uh, and Russia uh, want uh, so-called cyber sovereignty protected by the United Nations. The, the other uh, fields is so-called 5G technology, and uh, we need to accept that it is a, a tribe, the United States try to uh, promote the international containment uh, of uh, Huawei. This is a, a clear fact. Institution and resources for cyber security and United States, China, now uh, uh, countries from uh, European Union and European Union uh, have uh, institution uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, and resources. And as in uh, Cold War, it, when it was a nuclear uh, race, now it is a cyber arms race. And uh, the final question is about, it's about artificial intelligence. It was, in fact, uh, a game between two, between the United States and China, who uh, give uh, huge resources on this uh, subject. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the EU, it's, uh, my, in my opinion, a, a dwarf, a dwarf uh, on this uh, subject. I want to go uh, on the first uh, topic about WikiLeaks, and I call it deception by true. Why uh, 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 not uh, uh, by true? Because uh, they are using mainly the information based uh, on uh, uh, state uh, documents uh, provided by the by, uh, United States. What are the geopolitical aims? Uh, of uh, WikiLeaks uh, is that also the U U.S. uses the terrorist methods, and uh, I uh, that the second allies became enemies. What are the context? It was a, a new narrative. Uh, it was it's so called. It's cool to be whistleblower, and uh, uh, WikiLeaks uh, use it. Uh, uh, Two sources, a transgender uh, Chelsea Manning, uh, uh, she, she or he it, it is in, in jail in the United States and uh, was uh, catch in 2010. And uh, the famous also, it was Edward Snowden, uh, uh, he is uh, in the Russia Federation, uh, he is catch in uh, 2013. Wikileaks became uh, 
uh, problem for the United States in November 2007 when they uh, post uh, the information inside from a military uh, United States about the Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay uh, and uh, they show that also uh, the United States used the torture uh, uh, against uh, of so-called terrorists, international terrorists. But what is very important that uh, if uh, uh, United States want to close this uh, website, the ally from uh, NATO, Belgium, Belgium or uh, Germany, uh, keep uh, this uh, website functional. And in November 2010, uh, WikiLeaks uh, released uh, a huge uh, classified diplomatic cables uh, and uh, it was uh, a huge uh, international uh, uh, scandal. In uh, August uh, 2011, the German newspaper Der Freitag and Der Spiegel. Excuse me, five more minutes, Florin. Oh, 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 okay. I think you have many uh, other slides to present. So it, yes, I know. Uh, right. Offer also uh, a huge amount of, of information from of cables from uh, and from uh, U.S. Department of State. Other event was. Uh, so-called uh, the, the Angela Merkel uh, phones. And uh, uh, you can see here uh, uh, the image from uh, uh, Der Spiegel International uh, uh, Edition. And also it was the information that in fact, uh, United States spying uh, uh, his uh, closer uh, alike. Because uh, of the time, uh, of course, I don't uh, have uh, enough uh, time to go deeply on, on that. But uh, uh, last uh, important release, uh, it was uh, from uh, uh, WikiLeaks, it was uh, so-called uh, Fault 7, uh, CIA internal documentation of so-called massive arsenal of hacking uh, tools, including malware, uh, virus projects, and, and so on. I prepare also, but of course, we, do, we don't have enough time. Uh, how was used uh, uh, social media uh, by ISIS? Uh, uh, they uh, use it uh, te uh, Twitter, Telegram, and uh, it, I think it's very interesting that uh, they are use it uh, the images from movies like Matrix, uh, American Sniper, or video games, uh, Call of Duty, uh, GTA, uh, in order to uh, attract uh, uh, people, foreign citizens, to uh, go to to, to fight uh, for. Uh, for, for them. Ukraine, it was, uh, uh, I think, uh, very important uh, when we discuss uh, about the geopolitics of this information. And it was this information on Ukraine and about U Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, was a huge literature, international literature on, on that. Uh, presidential election uh, uh, in 2016 uh, was uh, a big event uh, uh, and uh, with uh, very important uh, uh, outcomes because uh, I prepare here uh, the uh, covers uh, of uh, reports. One, it was from the Senate uh, of the United States and also uh, from uh, the Department of Justice, so-called uh, the Mueller uh, report. And uh, it was uh, on the time of the Trump presidency, it was a huge debate about uh, uh, that in the United uh, uh, States. Here, 
uh, we have uh, a summary and the, the cover of uh, Oxford University report. Uh, they uh, provide enough uh, proofs uh, about the uh, involvement of Russia uh, on uh, US presidential uh, elections. I put on the on the screen uh, art uh, uh, section eight of uh, report of EU strategic communication to counteract anti propaganda by third parties. It, it was very uh, important because uh, it was a synthesis of so called uh, um, disinformation ecosystem uh, uh, control or, or create by Russian Federation. At the end. Another uh, report, uh, very fresh, uh, by the Sufan uh, Center, and uh, regarding the so-called uh, canon uh, uh, conspirational theories, and they uh, find the proof that uh, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, Iran was uh, involved in promoting uh, the conspiracy theory in the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, society. The conclusion, the concluding remarks, is that it's as uh, any time in history, industrial uh, revolutions, industrial uh, changes uh, go to the new uh, to to changes in the art of war uh, hybrid made hybrid media system of course it, uh, it, it is a precondition for the hybrid world social media uh, it was uh, a soft power of uh, great powers my conclusion uh, and we see that russian federation it was the most active uh, actor but not uh, the only one why russia because uh, uh, has a long traditional international subversion and historian uh, uh, know a lot but also uh, russia's leadership in fact putin sees international relations as a spy battlefield because uh, it was uh, so-called uh, professional deformation. Uh, uh. The golden age of this information through social media was uh, on past uh, decade, uh, was the golden age. And uh, because in my opinion, uh, the US and EU have been equipped with tools. We have strategic institution and put uh, resources a lot. And uh, in our societies, in the so-called Western part of, uh, of the world, it was a trivialization and fatigue of this information. Uh, uh, and uh, th that's why uh, I don't feel uh, that uh, we could uh, have a major uh, uh, success company uh, uh, campaign, uh, sorry, uh, of the information in our uh, states. In my opinion, the greatest vulnerability to the information is in so-called the buffer states, Ukraine, uh, uh, the Republic of Moldova, the Caucasus states, and also uh, could be uh, on uh, uh, the area of Western Balkans. And uh, uh, my last uh, uh, idea is that ideological and geopolitical tensions uh, between uh, democratic and authoritarian states continue to grow. The next challenge is the relationship between the artificial intelligence and uh, so uh, social media, and uh, the problem will be so-called uh, deep fakes. Thank you uh, very much. Of course, I skip uh, many uh, subjects, but uh, I want uh, to be in time. And uh, uh, after that, uh, if we have uh, time. Question and answers, yes. Thank you so yes. much, uh, Florin. It was very, very interesting. I also read it before, and you know, I found it fascinating, the wealth of information you have collected and collected for, for this event. And, I hope we'll have time more in the question and answers uh, session. Now I'd like us to concentrate on the next uh, speaker. He's uh, Mr. Paolo Cesarini. He's a 
very esteemed uh, professional senior uh, European Commission official and expert in fields, many fields actually. He's been on the EU competition law, digital single market policies. He's, he's been involved in leadership on the antitrust enforcement in the media sector, written a lot of legislative uh, instruments. Uh, indeed, you know, he has been head of state uh, aid policies for uh, research and development, innovation and environment in the DG competition. In last uh, position with the EU institution uh, where he spent a lot of his uh, career, he's been working on the DG Connect as a head of media convergence and social media. Of course, such a capacity uh, was uh, very good that he also spent time as a lecturer in various institutions and the universities also had time to write important books. For example, the recently published one, Regulating Big Tech to Counter Online Disinformation, Avoiding Pitfalls and While Moving Forward, and also Time to Act Against Fake News. So I really uh, think that we are all honored to have such a uh, capacity, uh, such an experience and uh, proven internationally uh, scholar to, to share with us. Uh, important uh, presentation. His uh, presentation will be on the disinformation and systemic risk in the digital information sphere. Mr. Paolo, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hope uh, that you can hear me well. It's all okay. Okay, thank you very much. So I will try in my presentation to bring into this very rich discussion during this three days conference, the point of view of a former policymaker uh, uh, at the commission and uh, someone who has been directly exposed uh, uh, to the problem of uh, designing policy responses at the EU level, at the level of the European Union, to this uh, uh, complex phenomenon. Uh, from a policy uh, making uh, perspective, I would say that tackling this information rises from the outset two big questions. The first one is about uh, uh, how to define the phenomenon. Uh, this information everybody knows has always existed, but uh, it, its impact and its nature has drastically changed with the rise of social media and online platforms as a privileged channel for many people to act, not only to access information, but also to produce uh, information in the digital uh, information ecosystem. Uh, look at, for instance, at the uh, presidential campaign uh, in the US, uh, the latest one in, two, uh, uh, in 2020, uh, a large majority of voters, so between 60 and 70% of voters have declared that they've acquired information about the elections via internet uh, uh, with the social media, search engines and messaging apps being the main gateways. And in this context, this information is not only about uh, establishing the veracity of the content, but also, and I would say mainly, about realizing the opportunities of manipulation that are offered by these new media. The second big question is about uh, uh, what to do. <laughs> uh, what is the appropriate mix of policy measures that are effective on the one hand, uh, encountering the weaponization of the digital information space. And uh, on the other side, uh, uh, they are uh, careful enough in their approach not to encroach on fundamental principles, on freedom of expression, freedom of speech and opinion. So one should realize that uh, this information is mainly, it's first of all, a catch-all term that describes a multifaceted phenomenon that entails what I would call 50 shades of harm. At one, on, at one end of the spectrum, you have uh, uh, the, uh, so this information may simply consist on in the inadvertent, uh, unintentional spread of misleading information amongst social media users, what you normally call misinformation. At the other end of the, spread, uh, of the spectrum, this information can be an intrinsic and therefore illegal component of a hate campaign or of a uh, uh, action designed to instigate violence or terrorist attacks. And in between these two extremes 
uh, it can take different forms from the international spread, intentional spread of deceptive information by individuals that pursue economic or political aims uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the organization of very sophisticated uh, campaign, disinformation campaigns uh, that are aimed to influence domestic audience or to foreign interference that use this information in hybrid scenarios to undermine the formation of political will of citizens. And if our regulatory frameworks in Europe, in, the, in our democratic societies, uh, contains effective remedies to tackle illegal content so that what is illegal offline should be also illegal online, the, uh, the problem arises when, it comes, uh, when the point comes to tackle uh, harmful but not necessarily illegal content, which is the case for disinformation, uh, for most cases of disinformation campaigns. We are always in the gray area. And to deal with this gray area requires, in fact, uh, to uh, 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 understand the root causes of the problem and to try to tackle them. So to understand this, I will now share uh, my presentation and go quickly through it. If I can actually share my screen, uh, bear with me a second. Um, normally it should be okay. Uh, just a second. Can you see my... No. Not yet. Can you see it now? Yes. Uh, Great. So let me uh, let me start with the first uh, uh, point. So, so this information in the digital age has uh, uh, created a global multifaceted phenomenon that it is intrinsically linked to the fact that online platforms and social networks has emerged as a fourth media, and that has uh, created a profound uh, uh, transformation of the media landscape, which in turn has triggered what I call a disinformation loop. Um, uh, there are four main types of impacts that the digital transformation of media has uh, led to. First of all, is the weakening of the traditional media due to the impact of the emergence of line platforms on the business models that have supported uh, the media ecosystem, the traditional media, uh, media ecos ecosystems. So newspapers, radio, and TV. Uh, and that it is also uh, has also entailed the emergence of new channels like blogs, forum, video sharing platforms that have progressively eroded the moderation and the agenda setting role of traditional media. The, the weakening of the media system has also had an impact on the content itself. So we have been talking about during the last years a lot about the uberization of the journalistic profession uh, in the traditional media. Uh, to express the idea that the journalism today, it is in a dire straits. It has been, it is under attack. It is under attack for several reasons. I will come in a second on this point, but also uh, has been combined with the uh, unprecedented opportunities and risks that uh, the social media environment has created for citizens. On the one side, of course, has presented incredible opportunities for democratic participation. You have seen it, for instance, in the recent past with the Arab Springs, uh, but also has created enormous risks uh, for uh, spreading extreme, shocking, misleading content. Uh, and you have seen it in many, unfortunately, examples later on, uh, were culminating with the Cambridge Analytical scandal, just to uh, re remind, you, remind one example. Uh, in turn, the, uh, this impact, uh, the, there is, has been a direct impact on the public sphere, which so, social media have become the new uh, uh, public sphere, uh, which have enabled a number of uh, manipulations uh, driven by technology, combined with inefficient uh, and uh, um, fragmented, I would say, uh, fact-checking activities, uh, where the network dynamics uh, embedded in social media have been created a fertile ground to normalize false narratives across wide audience. And finally, the fourth impact is on the cognitive sphere, sphere of individuals. So the algorithms which are embedded in the platform services uh, prioritize, as everybody knows, content that appeals more to the user's emotions and beliefs 
and uh, they prioritize uh, uh, content on the basis of popularity signals rather than the trustworthiness of sources rather than based on factual accuracy. And citizens have been uh, now exposed to this new media without having the adequate levels of uh, literacy. Now, just uh, to focus on these four impacts. So the first uh, is about uh, the media business model. Advertising, as you know, is the key sources of funding for traditional news media. And they, uh, in these media, compete with online platforms uh, for uh, capturing this value, for capturing uh, advertising money. And the, and the playing field is far from being a level playing field. Uh, newspaper and magazines, so you can see it also on the picture. Uh, this picture, uh, this graph uh, uh, describes uh, the uh, income from uh, uh, ad expenditures, from advertising expenditures. Uh, uh, it comprised the period 2019-2020 too, with, pro with an outlook which is very negative, but in particular for newspapers and magazines that uh, are not only losing grounds and the resources from their offline publications, but also they are increasingly unable to compensate those losses with additional uh, 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 incomes coming from digital advertising. Radio and TV are in a better competitive position. For instance, uh, the uh, non-linear TV or converged TV uh, keeps an edge on targeting advertising, so it becomes com remains competitive on the market, but linear commercial TV struggles. And uh, let's not remember that the biggest uh, uh, companies in terms of capitalization today, so which are the GAFA, uh, derives uh, from 80 to 90% of their income from advertising. And Google and Facebook captures 55% of digital ad revenues worldwide right now. Uh, the reaction from the media system, it is, has been a, a concentration. And concentration, so to, in order to you know, uh, optimize the cost, and to try to survive in this, this, in this difficult environment, uh, well, uh, you need to concentrate. And concentration may lead, unfortunately, to risks for media pluralism. Uh, the effect on journalism. The professional journalist now competes with the user-generated content for attention on social media, and there is a clearly a race for online visibilities, which erodes progressively the quality of the information online. The, uh, the, the lines between professional journalists and other news producing actors are increasing the actors like bloggers or uh, simply uh, uh, users of media uh, uh, are blurred and uh, that indicates also a, a, a contrast in terms of regulatory framework because if journalists are subject to deontological norms, other actors, they are not. And, that, and their content is only moderated by the online platform's terms of services. And uh, while the news outlets where journalists work are editorially responsible, online platforms are not liable for the content that they host. And that is uh, recognized in section 20, uh, 230 in the uh, Communication Decency Act in the United States and the, in the Electronic Commerce Directive uh, in, uh, in the EU. Um, all that has resulted, of course, in a, a, you see it from the graph, in a dramatic decrease of job losses uh, and job losses in the journalistic profession with 51% in the US in the last decade uh, of jobs being lost and with a very uh, mitigated uh, positive trend uh, in terms of employment of journalists in other news producing industries, which correspond to these new actors I was referring to. Uh, this, this fact has also created an opacity across the multitude of online information sources, which leads uh, to, uh, to, to meddle up, uh, to mix up uh, uh, virality with, trans, uh, uh, with trustfulness. Uh, uh, you don't, people, citizens, users of uh, online platforms have, uh, are at pain to understand what sources of information they are actually accessing online. What is their uh, trustworthiness? Uh, what is their credibility? And normally the virality of, a, a type of an information uh, takes over the actual accuracy uh, uh, of the so and credibility of the sources. Uh, 
In addition to that, and, and this point has already been clearly uh, underlined by the preceding speaker, the development of uh, AI pose additional new risks with the emergence of deep fakes, basically with the creation of new realities, virtual realities, that uh, um, live along the actual physical reality in which we believe to uh, conduct our lives. Uh, the third uh, impact, it is on the public sphere. Uh, as I said before, the online platforms, uh, especially social media, have become the main gateway for citizens to access information. Uh, so with networked information, so the exchanges that takes place on, on social media, taking over the uh, traditional role of media uh, to shape the public discourse. Uh, in the graph, you see uh, the percentage of uh, uh, adults in the US who have declared to get news uh, uh, from uh, uh, social media. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the vast majority, the, the, the boy, uh, this boils down to say that the vast majority of people now today get their news via social media. And this uh, combined with this prevalence of networked information over editorial uh, uh, information uh, leads to or contributes to the polarization of societal debates and the prevalence of views over news. So the distinction between, between what is a fact and what is an opinion is inc incredibly blurred nowadays. And this also leads to an erosion of scientific authority. You have seen it during the COVID pandemic, how many experts, virologists have been expressing their views and how difficult has become for citizens to understand the credibility of different point of views expressed in that connection. Uh, but behind that, there is a problem of vulnerabilities of online platforms. The technology has grown very fast. Mark Zuckerberg has admitted during the hearing before the uh, Congress that at the beginning he didn't expect its, uh, its product, its Facebook, to become uh, such a powerful mean for uh, either, uh, you know, political subversion or for political manipulation. He was uh, uh, taken uh, himself at short of uh, uh, understanding the consequences of what he was doing when he launched this new uh, uh, platform. And in this uh, environment, foreign or domestic actors can actually artificially amplify this information in hybrid geopolitical scenarios or even within national political context, uh, as you have seen uh, very recently during the presidential elections in 2020. Uh, the, on the, in, as regards the, in, the effects on the cognitive sphere. Uh, again, uh, the point here is that the media ecosystem has evolved faster than the user's digital literacy. And this has entailed a progressive loss of critical thinking uh, with uh, uh, users, citizens, uh, unintentionally participating to the spread of misinformation. Uh, this is linked to various phenomena, in information overload, shortening of attention span, addictive behavior that is provoked by these new technologies, especially for the younger audiences, uh, but also uh, um, has been propelled by the inability to assess the trustworthiness of information sources by uh, social media users. And several studies also confirm that it is uh, that people in general have um, problems to keep memory of the sources that have consulted online. In general, uh, there is a study uh, from the Oxford University that shows how uh, uh, the number of sources consulted uh, by uh, individual users has increased thanks to the development of digital media. But the ability to connect a source with a specific news brand has incredibly decreased. Therefore, there is no more uh, uh, indicators. I mean, there is a loss of uh, 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 awareness in terms of connecting an information source with authority of the, uh, uh, and responsibility of the, uh, of the editor. Um, in this context, uh, uh, and the, the picture there shows uh, to you how um, that there is still work to be done in Europe in terms of uh, bringing forward uh, media literacy 
uh, across uh, a quite uh, a diverse uh, uh, landscape where the levels are uh, not the same uh, in, uh, in different countries in Europe. So when it comes to uh, policy responses, uh, well, how to tackle the different elements of this uh, disinformation loops? Of course, it is a, a, the Commission has been very much involved in this, uh, in this uh, to address this challenge from the action plan that was adopted in 2018 to the latest information package, as we call it, in December 2020. It has tried to set up a, a multidimensional response to a multi this multifaceted phenomenon. And uh, on the one side, trying to level the playing field uh, through market regulation, setting new industrial policy for the new, to support <laughs> the media sector. Mr. Paolo, you have three more minutes, huh? Yeah, okay. General Rosenberg. On the other side, to tackle the issues around journalism and uh, to mobilize uh, on the public spheres uh, front uh, the um, online platforms in order for them to take responsibility that is commensurate to the role that they play in the modern societies, and finally, from the uh, on the on the front of the cognitive sphere, to raise uh, public awareness uh, uh, about this information, improving media literacy across wider audience. Uh, you know, the mix here it is about uh, uh, trying to combine regulatory instruments and non-regulatory instruments. So when you look at the, uh, at uh, uh, establishing a fair fairer and more competitive media markets, you see that uh, recently the Digital Market Act adopted in December 2020 tries to curb the power of large, large gatekeeper platforms and to rebalance the bargaining position of news publishers, but also competition tools are very important to create a level playing field and the access of the to the money, to the advertising resources. You have had in 2019, the Google AdSense case, for instance. But that is not enough. You need also to use other policy tools. Industrial policy tools have been announced in the media and audiovisual action plan, always in December 2020, to, uh, to try to use research and development infrastructure funding, uh, funding under the different programs, Digital Europe or Horizon Europe, uh, to create a, 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 a system whereby uh, funding from the public authorities does not interfere with the editorial independency of the beneficiaries. On the uh, front of the uh, journalist uh, empowerment of journalists, uh, the regulatory instruments are, uh, are very difficult to use. There is a subsidiarity principle that limits the scope. And the main action uh, that can be taken, it is really on the basis of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and on, on, the, on a strong enforcement of the rule of law. This has been announced in the Democracy Action Plan, always in December 2020, which has in particular announced one, uh, some safeguards to protect journalists, in particular uh, to protect their safety. We you know how exposed to threats and even to uh, life threats are journalists today. On the soft policy instruments, uh, there is a uh, different ways uh, that can respect uh, uh, to, to support journalism while respecting their independence. Uh, funding, for instance, projects that promote uh, uh, cross-border collaborations, innovation in uh, newsrooms, training of journalism. And this is being done in particular under the Creative Europe program. There are also other initiatives against uh, uh, strategic lawsuits uh, uh, against public participation, the so-called anti-slap initiatives, uh, uh, through also, uh, I mean, uh, using also funding for uh, uh, training uh, journalists on uh, cybersecurity and safety. Um, then uh, when you look at the, how to make uh, the online information space a safer and trusted and more trusted uh, space, here you can combine hard law and safe law regulation to hold platforms accountable for the systemic risks that stems from their services. You have the Digital Service Act. Again, we are talking about an initiative launched in December 2020 with due diligence requirements for very large online platforms. Uh, <coughs> Let, let's conclude, please. Yes, I've only yeah, one really, yeah. lecture. Sure, sure. Uh, Very interesting, I have to say that. Yes. So yeah, that it is the main thing to, 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 to oblige 
platforms to assess the system, the systemic risks that are created by their platforms, so, so the intentional manipulation of their services that involves an inauthentic use or automated exploitation of these uh, uh, platforms, and also to take mitigation measures and to subject this mitigation measure to independent audit and oversight. But that is not enough. You need also to have adequate policies that are taken by the platforms themselves that reflect the specificity of their services and the code of practice that has been adopted in 2018, it is now under the review. The important things, demonetizing the purveyor of this information to ensure a responsible algorithmic design to set up measures to counter manipulative behavior, not content, behavior, and to ensure transparency, political advertising, and to foster research through data disclosures. I come to the end, and the end I think is very important. I think everybody has been said before, everybody revolves around to make people more informed, more aware, more literate in the uh, digital information space. Again, there is not much room about regulatory instrument. This is a, a subject matter that remains very much within the competence of member states, but much more can be done in order to, in, to, pro, to, to promote projects that uh, uh, devise new methodologies and new approaches for uh, uh, spreading, uh, uh, you know, for uh, um, increasing the level of media literacy for all people of all ages. And this is my, uh, my final point. There is also a need for uh, an infrastructure to build up a multidisciplinary research around the phenomenon. And this infrastructure is now being created with the launch of the European Digital Media Observatories in June 2020. This is coordinated by the European Institute, uh, uh, University Institute in Florence. And its mission, it is to, to support fact-checking activities across Europe, to develop research on a multidisciplinary level to better understand the threats, the impacts of this information, and lastly, and not leastly, to improve media literacy across practitioners and also with the help and with the collaboration of media. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, indeed. It's a lot of food for thoughts. Now, floor is to Bartosz to moderate the session on questions and answers. Thank you, Ms. Sula. I would also like to thank all uh, the speakers for very uh, insightful and interesting presentations. Um, and let's begin the Q&A session. We have around 23 minutes for it. Um, and I would uh, like to ask you to answer briefly the questions be because uh, we have a, a whole bunch of them. So um, maybe beginning with the uh, first two uh, Dr. Kaminski, um, what are your plans of, for dissemination or implementation of the project uh, that you were describing? Um, are you going to conduct any research on how it works, what it changes, how effective the strategy solutions you propose are? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Voidan, for asking this um, uh, this question. So first of all, as I said, uh, this is an ongoing, not finished uh, project. Uh, so right now we would like to add more material, especially in this educational, um, uh, educational sphere. Um, uh, but of course, uh, in the next stage, we would like to have uh, feedback because, uh, of course, those educational materials were reviewed uh, by specialists in the uh, in the field of um, of education, but uh, we need to check um, uh, if it's working in, in in practice. If, for example, the teachers will be uh, interested. Uh, the, another problem we need to face right now is to obtain more uh, educational material uh, from specialists in other countries because uh, um, because of, of various reasons. And uh, right now. Um, right now, um, we um, have uh, the material mainly focused, for example, on Polish sources. Uh, some, some of the materials for teachers uh, are of universal nature, 
uh, but uh, but uh, a part is is connected with with the Polish history or Polish experience, and we would like uh, in the next stage uh, to ask uh, teachers or specialists from other countries to prepare also uh, another uh, another materials. Then uh, we would like to have this feedback from uh, especially from from teachers and and high school uh, stu students. Um, and uh, the, the last part of the question is. Uh, mm, uh, raises another question you know, how to check if it's working you know so we should organize probably a kind of um, survey like uh, this one presented yesterday by dr uh, brakeston yes and to check uh, students before uh, how are they skills uh, in digital world if they are able to recognize this uh, this information fake news and after uh, after um, uh, coming uh, becoming familiar with our, with our materials, but it's it's a question if uh, there will be um, uh, sources, especially the budget for for such a such a survey. But it's a very valid uh, valid question and an important issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, from the audience is basically to all the participants. Um, one of uh, our uh, listeners uh, wonders to what extent do sharp public arguments uh, among historians or other researchers who after all also have varied opinions on uh, various matters um, uh, how do they um, affect their um, legitimacy and the the fact that they can actually um, their trustworthiness also in the eyes of those whom they should somehow convince, right? So that is the question of to what extent the elites should have more or less the same message for the broad audience and whether this audience will understand that their differences of opinions um, are not disinformation, but just normal uh, uh, various opinions. Uh, yes, Mr. Jantowski. But please turn on uh, the microphone. Thank you. Uh, you know, under the conditions we work in in Europe, I mean, it's conceivable that uh, we work to uh, reach a, a common position or a common stand on an issue while acknowledging some differences. But in other situations, it is, it is not possible. Uh, take uh, the modern history of, of Israel. There are two opposing narratives on, uh, on that one from Israeli historians and, uh, and supporting historians, the other one from from uh, Palestinian and Arab uh, uh, scholars, and uh, they are not compatible. They are opposing each other. But uh, as uh, historians discover new and acknowledge uh, new sources, uh, like in the school of the Israeli new historians, you know they will come to accept some of the. Uh, uh, claims by by the uh, opposing school, by the opposing narrative, not making their narrative less credible, but more credible. So the more plastic our knowledge of history is, and the more reliable sources it is based on, the more credible it will become in spite of the arguments uh, that that will persist. I mean, I think uh, we have, uh, at least in our part of the world, we have reasons to suspect history when it becomes too uniform and, uh, and too smooth. That uh, is uh, a cause for concern. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Professor Abraham. I think uh, you need to put on the on this equation because it's not a bilateral equation between historian, elite of historian, and the public. We need to put the, the fact that our 
conduct it is intermediate by media because uh, even the we uh, well known historians don't uh, cannot reach uh, a very large uh, audience uh, by uh, or with uh, very academic books and the solution and it is a solution it is uh, so called documentaries provided by uh, 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 channels like Discovery, National Geographic, <laughs> History, and the others, and also uh, documentaries for, uh, provided by, uh, uh, on internet. And very important is that documentaries to be based uh, on the academic uh, and, and, and very uh, well done uh, uh, historian books. Because uh, otherwise, uh, I, I don't really, I don't uh, could imagine that a million of people or billions of people of, of people will uh, have time enough time uh, or skill to uh, read, for example, uh, the history of Rome by uh, Theodor Mommsen. To, 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 to give an example, so it's not a problem to catch a huge audience, it is a problem to have the, of, of what is called true about the facts that we know until the moment when we wrote the books. That is true, but on the other hand, there are a lot of heated debates, for example, in Poland, which uh, deal with various um, um, historical, but still uh, often still living uh, people. Uh, personalities and the the points of view are extremely different. Take, for example, President Valenza, and therefore sometimes it is difficult to distinguish whether who's right, especially that uh, these um, opinions also of historians are uh, uh, written are um, uh, presented by mainstream media, just these media represent different political views. So there is uh, something of what uh, Professor Bargan was uh, talking yesterday, that is this um, infodemic. Um, if, if there are no further comments to it, then maybe I'll proceed to next question. Yes, Mr. Cesarini? Just unmute, please. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I would say that uh, mm, the existence of uh, opposing narratives, uh, it is uh, in uh, historical terms, it is not a problem as such. Uh, the real problem is uh, uh, the credibility of the sources on which these narratives uh, are based on. And for that, I think that we are uh, quite behind in terms of establishing a, a shared uh, uh, methodology for assessing the trustworthiness of information sources. We are driven by, uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, the truth is created by the impression of popularity. That is the new normal under the, in the social media environment. Whereas I think there is work to be done in terms of assessing the trustworthiness of the sources where the information uh, is drawn and which is used to build up uh, historical uh, narratives which have an historical impact. Uh, for that, I think this work ahead, it is around fact checking, but also around uh, 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 creating algorithms that will drive our knowledge about what happens in the world, uh, algorithms that should be reconsidered deeply by the uh, holder of these uh, systems, uh, so the platforms, to incorporate signals that reflect trustworthiness rather than popularity. Mm, okay. Now, I, I would have also um, a question to basically, again, all panelists, that is, um, uh, Professor Abraham mentioned the CNN, which was banned when he was in China. Um, and I remember uh, some years ago, I met a colleague from China and she was very surprised when she saw um, Google Maps because she thought that that is something which should be a, a secret. So, but, but I could understand her because I had my own experience from the communist Poland where the maps were also very mm -hmm. often uh, falsified and uh, made secret. So the question is, are we here in East Central Europe more immune to disinformation and propaganda because we have our own experience, uh, which is rooted in the communist era, maybe even longer? 
Um, and is that one of the experiences that we could share with the rest of the world? Yes, Mr. Kaminski. Uh, I think we have uh, some experience to, uh, uh, to share, uh, but I'm not sure if we are still immune. Uh, it's um, over 30 years now uh, after the fall of communism in the majority of the countries in our part of Europe, uh, and uh, I'm afraid we are losing it. Yes, of course, there are some still, still some traces, but it's like uh, with diseases, uh, a time is working against us. Um, so it's another um, issue for, for historians, I think, yeah? how to, to make this part of history um, uh, to, to history of history vivid uh, and and to 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 bring it into uh, discussion also in uh, in this European level mentioned by uh, Mr. Cesarini in his in, in his uh, presentation. Yeah, because uh, it's always a problem how to regulate, but the problem also how to avoid overregulation, for example. Yeah, how to uh, on the one hand, uh, be safe from various dangers coming from this sphere, but uh, to protect freedom on the other hand. And I think uh, this um, uh, this experience of East Central Europe is uh, quite interesting in this in this aspect, especially because uh, we can think, for example, uh, on independent circulation of information under communism. Uh, in various ways, you know, starting uh, with spreading some rumors, but also more organized like underground press, like a kind of precursor of, uh, uh, of social networks, because it was also a kind of social network, yes, operating without internet, yes, and uh, uh, maybe we could analyze it, we, we did not uh, yet uh, analyze it in, in this aspect, yes, from, from we didn't look uh, on this phenomena from this angle, and uh, maybe it could help us yes, in all our discussions um, what to do with, with all of these problems. Okay. Um, then I would uh, also have a question from our audience to Mr. Cesarini. Um, how uh, can you, how will you assess the effectiveness of the European policies against disinformation? Oh, we can't hear you? Okay. I'm, I'm muted. Uh, well, it, the last things I did before leaving the commission was to assess the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, the um, self-regulatory um, uh, instruments that have been created in order to uh, curb the uh, discretional power of large platforms. And, the, uh, and to be honest, the, um, the, the, the conclusion of that assessment, uh, I'm talking about September 2020, uh, uh, was rather mitigated. Uh, hence the need to have uh, a more comprehensive co-regulatory framework, which, I mean, balance well the need to preserve freedom and, uh, and diversity in the opinions with the, uh, with the uh, softer uh, instruments. And more importantly, I think uh, 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 it is uh, an ongoing battle. To, um, the more important idea, I think, is that uh, this is an, an ongoing uh, battle uh, uh, to strengthen the, me the news media uh, sector, to, to increase media literacy across wide uh, uh, sector of the uh, citizenship, to, uh, to have more responsible and more trustworthy uh, uh, online platforms and to have a journalistic profession that is really recognized for the value that brings into the public discourse uh, due to the authority and the responsibilities that journalists take on themselves for what they say, for what they write. All this is an ongoing battle. So uh, to, re to a short answer to this very important question. Uh, yes, we are in the, in the middle of the pathway, which is, I think, uh, pointing to the right direction, but the results for the moment are not conclusive. We need to go on. Okay, thank you. Um, and there is also a question to Mr. Abraham, because you, you said that the golden, golden age of um, uh, the disinformation has basically finished by giving the, uh, the final date as 2020 in your presentation. So um, does 
uh, and the audience wonders if that's really um, right because we have observed a number of uh, uh, disinformation waves connected with the COVID, with vaccinations, etc. Yes, when I spoke about the golden age of this information, uh, I have in mind that this information with geopolitical reasons on social media. Of course, in the coming years, this information will be full in our society. But uh, the, the problem is we could change the politics or not with this kind of tools. And in my opinion, because uh, I spoke mainly uh, this information as a tool of foreign policy. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we see that uh, uh, now uh, Russian Federation, who was the main provider uh, of this, understand that uh, understand what are the risks, what are the risk, uh, risk uh, to continue on this uh, way. So uh, uh, this, uh, I think will the the uh, this information will continue, but in our societies because because uh, a lot of teams, but not as a main political geopolitical instrument. I hope uh, it was clear what I want to say when I say golden age. Of course, we will continue, but w w without uh, uh, geopolitical achievements, as was uh, in the case on the situation of uh, Trump uh, elections. Uh, yes, Mr. Jantowski. Uh, microphone. Uh, okay. With uh, all due respect, Professor Abraham, I I think this may be a little too optimistic uh, conclusion. We are at the moment in the midst of a, a medium serious diplomatic conflict with Russia uh, over an explosion that took place seventy years ago in a munition factory in. In, in Moravia, and <clears throat> we are witnessing a large offensive, a massive offensive of fake news, disinformation, uh, instigated, there's no question about it, by uh, Russian-related uh, sources. So uh, I'm afraid that uh, Russia is not beyond using this uh, weapon uh, uh, on uh, an occasion and maybe even as a strategic weapon. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. Russia will try in, in some uh, situation, but the problem it is what are the effects? Because our situation, our societies became uh, step by step immune on this uh, kind of instruments. This is, I this envy is you. <laughs> I envy your society. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And by the way, uh, Mr. Zandowski, um, then I would have a question to you as a diplomat uh, of the Czech Republic. Um, has uh, the Czech uh, for Ministry of Foreign Affairs created any special department uh, uh, fighting disinformation? Um, it, it, is it involved somehow? Uh, not directly. There is a body to combat disinformation under the Ministry of Interior of, uh, of the Czech Republic and some of the uh, leading researchers and scholars are working with uh, that center. But uh, as uh, Mr. Cesarini said, the results so far are uh, not uh, too too satisfying. Okay. Um, well, we have we are almost finished. Um, so let me maybe conclude by saying, uh, in a maybe fairly optimistic way, that even though this information is and I'm sure will be still used by various 
mainly authoritarian countries and their foreign uh, policies, um, the very fact that people are more and more aware of the very idea of fake news, information bubble, etc., because it is slowly getting into the uh, discourse uh, of the public debate, I think they will be uh, step by step uh, getting immune to it, or at least aware of it. Um, so uh, by saying that, I would like to thank all our great speakers and our audience, of course. There were a few dozens of people listening to us, and I would like to invite you to the next, the final panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are uh, uh, opening now uh, the final session of our uh, conference, which I would uh, like to confess, it seems to me to be the to be the most difficult one, because we would have to uh, uh, select uh, to single out some recommendation from the. Uh, 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 entire conference uh, in order uh, to be able to, to work out uh, a guide uh, to prevent disinformation, uh, namely um, managing to offer to those uh, interested a kind of uh, handbook of how to uh, tackle with this uh, word of um, and actions of disinformation or fake news or whatever, how we would call it, which uh, since uh, uh, President Trump took uh, the White House in 2017, uh, this uh, word or this think tank of fake news and disinformation and things like that had become a common uh, um, denomination of uh, what we have uh, called prior to that uh, uh, propaganda and information war. So uh, I would begin uh, with the fact, beginning with the fact that uh, uh, I am considering that this panel is among uh, the most difficult ones, hopefully with the support of our audience we would be able, together with our panelists, and I would present them, uh, the first uh, panelist I would present immediately, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's my duty to uh, inform the audience that uh, due to the family problems, uh, Mr. Dungaciu, who is a well-known political scientist and historian here in Romania, uh, is not able to attend our panel uh, so the first uh, panel, uh, uh, the first, uh, sorry, the first uh, uh, paper would be presented by uh, Professor Jan Riedel and uh, uh, Bartosz and Professor Bartosz uh, Jevanowski Stefanczyk. Sorry for uh, bad pronunciation. Uh, and I have uh, the honor to present some uh, biographical notes of both of them. Uh, it seems to me that the, for the, the audience, both of them are well known. Professor Jan Riedel is professor until 2010, researcher and professor at the famous Hagelonian University, uh, and currently is professor at the Pedagogical University of Krakow. Between 2001 and 2005, he headed the Office of Culture, Science and Information at the Polish Embassy in Berlin. Since 2008, Professor Riedel has been Poland representative on the board of the Polish German Foundation for Science. He is the deputy chairman of uh, the steering committee of our network um, and um, coordinates the Polish side in the European Network Remembrance uh, and Solidarity. Fields of research of Professor uh, uh, Riedel are uh, East Central Europe and Polish-German relations in the 19th and 20th century. He is the author of uh, um, oh, a, a book written in Polish, in uh, Polish language, Politics of History in Federal Republic uh, of Germany, Legacy, Ideas, and Practice, to, uh, which had appeared in 2011. And together uh, with Stefan Probst, uh, they have uh, been editors of history of, uh, as an instrument of contemporary international conflicts, uh, which uh, would appear at the um, uh, publishing house, uh, British publishing house, Rutledge, 2021. Uh, I would kindly invite uh, both of them uh, who 
to prevent their paper uh, in accordance with their uh, own procedure. Who would be the first? Hello, yes, I will be the first to speak. Um, I'll just uh, share the presentation. It's almost done. Right. Um, let me begin with um, two examples related to Polish German cultural uh, relations. The year 2011 saw so one of the biggest ever exhibitions devoted to Polish German relations in Berlin, entitled Tour an Tour in German, which can be translated as Next to Each Other. It was part of the cultural program of the Polish presidency of the EU, as well as means of celebrating the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Polish-German Treaty of Good Cooperation and Neighborly Relations. Um, this exhibition um, revealed different sensitivities and approaches to public history in both countries. Um, its curator, Anda Rotenberg, one of the most well-known Polish curators and art historians, uh, stated that she was forced to remove a work of art from the exhibition in Polish called Berek, uh, that is in translation Game of Tag, uh, by Artur Żmijewski, which you can see here at the presentation, um, which features a group of naked people playing in a gas chamber. Um, later, we can discuss also this art of work. There were also attempts not to present the artwork by Zbigniew Libera, which you can now see, uh, uh, Lego concentration camp. Both Zmijewski and Libera are some of the best uh, contemporary Polish artists. Their idea had nothing to do with making fun of the Holocaust. Uh, however, the Polish side was forbidden to present issues related to concentration camps or Holocaust in a way which was untypical and seemed uh, to be offensive in Germany. Um, the other example is related to the film Unsere Mütter, Unsere Väter from 2013. You can see a screen of a TV series. Um, it was a story of a group of friends from Germany during uh, the Second World War. Some of them found themselves in war-torn Poland. Uh, the way the Poles were presented to a vast extent as anti-Semites uh, aroused numerous discussions in Poland and, and led to a dispute, also a diplomatic dispute between Poland and Germany. Um, it revealed German ignorance about the history of the German occupation of Poland, which is still known to a, a very small extent in Germany during the Second World War. On the other hand, it showed how fragile um, uh, Polish-German understanding and reconciliation could be. Uh, the above examples prove that memory conflicts result from a clash of different political cultures, different cultures of memory, and from a lack of knowledge or sensitivity towards the other party. History-related dis discussions have resulted also from uh, policies of various states trying to impose certain narratives or interpretations of the past by various types of memory loss. Eventually, all that has led to proposing um, so-called guidelines or codes of good conduct while writing about and presenting history, not only in um, academic works, but also in films, theater plays, uh, different sorts of um, uh, culture, uh, in culture. In this brief overview, we would like to present reasons for introducing various mechanisms, channeling historical research. We would also like to discuss various dangers related to the activity of the state in this field. Above all, we will present the above mentioned guidelines for historical dialogue. First, however, we need to discuss what is called memory loss. Um, the influence of the state and international institutions on memory and research is manifold and has always existed. Um, the influence of the state may be manifested in symbolic forms by changing the names of streets, erecting monuments, making changes, curricula, uh, 
creating or dissolving, that is equally important, institutions dealing with history or, or culture, and so on. An important element is legislation, which uh, gives certain interpretations of the past in the form of legal norms, both punitive and non-punitive. Laws to punish Holocaust denial have been adopted in Europe since the 1980s. Spain has extensive legislation in relation to its civil war. Uh, similarly, the Armenian genocide is sometimes the subject of laws and prosecutions uh, for denialism. However, in Turkey, um, the exact opposite is true. That is, those who describe it as a genocide and point to Turkey as the guilty party are punished. Then the Israel protects the memory of Holocaust um, and bans its denial. Uh, Rwanda bans genocide denial um, uh, by uh, severely punishing uh, the genocide ideology. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina has so far refrained from uh, doing uh, the same uh, in, in regarding the genocide in Srebrenica. Also, Ukraine did not enact uh, criminal law provisions which would penalize Holodomor denial. Although the Great Famine of the 1930s um, uh, is uh, a pr a presented as a genocide against the Ukrainian people. Um, important here is the notion of the good name of the nation or national pride and the punishment for offending them. And it is a, uh, its importance is growing also uh, recently, for example, Francis Fukuyama wrote about it. In 2018, an attempt was made to amend the act of the Polish Institute of National Remembrance, which was created in 1998. Um, it was motivated uh, uh, by a peculiar scourge that is the unreflective use of by journalists in various parts of the world of the terms Polish concentration camps. Um, in the reference to Auschwitz and other extermination camps located on the territory of occupied Poland during the Second World War, which were founded, managed and operate, operated by the German SS. In order to counteract this false term, uh, the Polish same amended the Institute of National Remembrance Act, according to which people who blame Poles as a collective nation or society for complicity in the Holocaust and, and by doing so soiled the good name of Poles were to be held criminally responsible. Although the Polish legislator wrote that it did not intend to interfere with scientific research and publications, the wording of the act was so vague and ambiguous that it provoked huge also international protests. Um, then there is also uh, symbolic legislation that I will skip. Um, we also have non-punitive legislation uh, at the European level, like for example, the 2008 uh, resolution which passed creating the European Day of um, uh, Remembrance for the Victims of Totalitarian Regimes. This resolution is an example of a symbolic act which was introduced by a non-state actor, um, which nevertheless influences collective uh, memory and to some extent the interpretation of history. In 2018, the European Parliament passed a resolution that primarily aims to defend research freedom, which is threatened by various factors, including authoritarian governments. Now, France has been the scene um, of many disputes over memory loss. French law of 2005, and I won't go here into details, uh, spoke among other things of the positive role of the French presence in North Africa, the colonial presence, provoked numerous objections. Now, some French historians defended the laws prohibiting neg negationism, but opposed too much state interference in some, however, advocated almost for complete freedom and passed what is known as the Loi Appeal in 2008. It stated, among other things, that, and I'm quoting, history must not be a slave of contemporary politics, nor can it be written on the command of competing memories. In a free state, no political authority has the right to define historical truth 
and to restrain the freedom of the historian with the threat of panel sanctions, end of quote. This appeal has recently been brought up again in Poland as a result of a trial of two Holocaust researchers, Professor Barbara Engelking and Professor Jan Grabowski. They were sued by a relative of a person described in their book. It turned out that Angel King made a mistake in one of the footnotes when she blamed a particular person for the deaths of several dozen Jews, when on the contrary, this person helped Jews who were in hiding. Admittedly, false accusations of this kind must be very painful for the family of the uh, accused. However, a specific flavor was given to this case by the fact that the person who brought the case was actively supported by the Polish League Against Defamation, a formerly non-governmental organization, which, however, uh, has close ties to the current Polish authorities. The latter support the commemoration of Holocaust victims and do not deny that there were Poles during the war who behaved reluctantly and hostilely towards Jews and even committed crimes against them. But the current official politics of memory highlights those Poles who, had, who saved Jews. One can therefore get the impression that the main reason for the trial was not to establish the truth and restore the good name of the wrongly accused, but the desire to create a deterrent precedent that would make historians think twice before discussing Poles as perpetrators of crimes against Jews. The court of first instance ruled in this case that Engel, King and Grabowski should apologize to the relative of the wrongly accused, but at the same time, the court dismissed the motion to fine the historians. In connection with the trial, a large part of the research community in Poland, as well as abroad, expressed its opposition, stressing that courts cannot decide about historical truth. A fairly clear position on this issue was taken by the Polish Historical Society in its 2020 proposal for a code of ethics. It stated, among other things, that, I'm quoting, historians should safeguard the freedoms and rights necessary to conduct research, opposing attempts to restrict them or to impose their opinions on the past by authorities or courts. End of quote. Uh, now it's uh, up to Jan Riddel. Yes. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Yes, fine. Uh, however, it is not always the state that uh, uh, defines uh, the discourse. Uh, sometimes historians themselves introduce rules that restrict freedom of expression to some extent. One example would be, uh, uh, would be the outcome of what is called historical streit in German, uh, the debate of historians which took place in Germany around uh, 1986. Uh, the imme immediate re reason for it was uh, an article by the historian Ernst Norita, who by drawing attention to the chronological priority of communist crimes, and the allegedly reactive nature of those committed by national so socialism relativized uh, the uh, later according to many. Without going into the details of the debate in which the majority of important German historians took part, uh, it must be said uh, 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 that uh, it resulted in the formation of a specific canon of narration that continues in Germany to these this days. It consists in, uh, in emphasizing uh, the uniqueness of the crime of the Holocaust and Germany's guilt. However, with the fall of communism, this clear narrative came to face the memory of those from the former German Democratic Republic and the rest of East Central Europe, the symbol of which became Gulag. This led to numerous disputes in Germany 
and eventually uh, to the conclusion, also known as the uh, Faulenbach formula, that, I quote, uh, uh, one must not relativize the crimes of national socialism by addressing the crimes of Stalinism. One must not downplay the crimes of Stalinism by pointing to the crimes of national socialism. In practice, attention is often paid only to the first sentence of this formula, which not only makes comparat comparative research difficult, but also leads to a kind of uh, holocaustization of the memory and to disputes with the memory of East Central Europe, which is uh, precisely uh, the memory of two uh, totalitarianism. In response to memory conflicts uh, of the early uh, 21st century, the German historian Hans Henning Hahn proposed already in 2006 a set of rules for the uh, politics of memory which would respect uh, the different autonomous uh, collective memories. And quite, uh, uh, a difficult past can be overcome only through dialogue of memory. Yet this dialogue uh, should follow certain rules. The European network Remembrance and Solidarity has, uh, has un, uh, undertaken to outline such a set of good practices for dialogue. These relate primarily to what principles should guide the creator of permanent and temporary museum exhibitions, uh, literary works, documentaries, historical films, websites, and other creative uh, works uh, so that they become good tools for international dialogue about history. This is how the guidelines for international discourse on history and memory, uh, which lists uh, good practices, have been developed. developed. Uh, first, uh, one should present points of view of as many parties as possible involved in a given historical event. However, one should not present in, af in af an affirmative um, tone totalitarian, racist, and chauvinistic visions of the world. Second, one should avoid deterministic expressions about dependence between historical events and current uh, relations. Third, one should avoid generalizations. Uh, it means transferring both negative uh, and positive evaluations of the actions of individuals to entire communities. Four, uh, historical figures, including perpetrators, should be treated as individuals and not as, a, as representati representatives of whole societies. Fifth, a historical basis should be ensured, which means that, the, uh, that even fictional plots in works uh, relating to history uh, should correspond as closely as possible to the authentic context of events. Sixth, each initiative should have a clearly defined nature as this will enable the general public to distinguish between documentation based on scientific research and works containing plots uh, of varying uh, degrees of fiction. Seventh, uh, the latest academic knowledge should be used as a starting point for any initiative in the presentation of history. Creators should make extensive use of academic consultation and indicate such consultation transparently in their works. 
faith, uh, up-to-date didactical concepts uh, and, and technological standards should be applied uh, in all forms of hist historical presentation. The guidelines proposed by the ENRS uh, concern how authors should proceed in order for their historical works to foster dialogue and understanding. They do not, however, address commissioning and financing the creation of works related to history. It means the institutional and political factor shaping historical policies. In uh, 2017, uh, an attempt uh, to create a list of guidelines was made by Professor Klaus Zimmer's team, uh, which produced recommendations for history policy in Poland and Germany. The authors emphasize the importance of independence by writing uh, that, I, I quote, uh, in historical policy, one should strive to minimize political intervention and to completely exclude manipulation of the past. They go on the, to list further principles of historical policies, such as uh, controversiality, and state uh, that should be based on a, a broad pluralistic public debate. Among, uh, among a series of recommendations, the authors also stressed that uh, although, I quote, uh, uh, each country uh, must find an appropriate way of working out history, taking into account its political culture, normative structures and traditions. Yet taking into account neighboring countries, religions, cultures and traditions would be very useful. Radical changes in political system and governments are very often accompanied uh, by a, a reinterpretation of what is known as the framer, framework of memory. This is a crucial moment which may significantly influence society's system of values. It is therefore essential how we react to changes in this framework. I, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in view of the uh, visible pushing of democracy to the defensive in the contemporary world, and the growing offensive of fake news using the powerful online instruments, it may turn out that increasingly often we will find uh, it expedient to introduce fixed interpretation of selected issues from the past and to guarantee them by law. On the other hand, however, it is important to ensure uh, that such established narratives do not restrict academic freedom and the freedom of speech or uh, that we do not discriminate uh, against the memory of others. A separate issue is the question of the effectiveness of the norms of historical narrative. Presumably, mm, they will be effective only in relations to a specific group of states and societies. However, they will not reduce the threats uh, from authoritarian states, including those uh, uh, that use disinformation, manipulation, and fake news in their narratives about the past uh, and treat them as standard tools of their foreign policy. Moreover, uh, these considerations seem to point to the similarity of the matter discussed here with uh, uh, the much broader issue of human rights. Perhaps in the not too distant future, we will see the right to an objective in the sense of uh, uh, conforming to the 
uh, findings uh, of science, objective and responsible presentation of our past as our human right. The question is, of course, who will verify this truthfulness and uh, on what principles and whether this will not, like some memory laws, be a kind of restriction of the freedom of speech. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Rizzo, for your contribution. I understand Professor Ionescu. No, he is here. Okay, so I will not interfere. We can't hear you. Now, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I am sure that uh, would be uh, several questions uh, concerning uh, the content of, because it's very important uh, for our topic. And uh, uh, since the beginning, I already realized that I have a debt to you, Bartosz, to, to, to present uh, entirely your uh, uh, biographical notes, but I would do it. Uh, Not at all. No, no, I would do it uh, prior to the concluding uh, remark, which would be, uh, which would be, um, how to say, um, presented by yourself. Am I right? Yeah, immediately yes. after us. Yes, wouldn't be, exactly. wouldn't, wouldn't be a break between our session nope. and. Con okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, so now I am uh, introducing to our audience. Uh, Professor Igor Gretzky, uh, who is um, Associate Professor at the School of International Relations of the St. Petersburg State University, Associate Professor. He is a PhD in history. He told us prior to the entire audience to be able to hear that he was born in Anapa, namely on the Black Sea Shore, so close to Romania. Uh, and um, uh, now he moved up north. Uh, do you like cold? It seems to be cold weather. Uh, and um, uh, now he uh, has a, a PhD in history of international relations and foreign policy. The title had, uh, had been obtained in 2009. Between uh, 2012 and 2014, he headed uh, uh, the rectorate, the international office at the Smolny campus. Um, and his fields uh, of uh, research and interest uh, are Russia's foreign policy towards uh, East Central Europe, Polish-Russian relations and theory and practice of post-conflict reconciliation, these are the two main topics for him. Uh, Dr. Gretzky has been a, a contributor um, for a variety of print and electronic media, both in Russia and abroad. Recently, he published Lukianov Doctrine, Conceptual Origins of Russia's Hybrid, uh, hybrid Foreign Policy, The Case of Ukraine, uh, was published in the St. Louis University Law Journal in 2020, uh, and uh, uh, also another uh, uh, study is uh, Russian intervention in the Ukrainian presidential election uh, of 2004. Uh, it was published in um, uh, a book uh, edited by, by Koval and Mink, and also Reihard, there are three editors, entitled Three Revolutions, Mobilization and Change in Contemporary Ukraine, Theoretical Aspects and Analysis on Religion, 
Memory and Identity, was published in Stuttgart in 2019, uh, his uh, uh, article. So according to uh, his uh, field of interest and, uh, uh, and uh, the studies which had been published up to now, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Gretzky, Igor, you are the first Russian uh, uh, coming to our network to present. Uh, uh, and you, I would say, is among the most qualified uh, Russian experts in order to present uh, how Russia is sees uh, is Central Europe. And uh, especially, it seems to me that your main interest is uh, focused on Ukraine. Being from the southern Russia, it seems to me that you are, uh, uh, how to say, you are, uh, you have a legitimate interest in uh, in Ukraine. Okay, so uh, I would kindly ask you to present, including your title, because uh, being in a hurry, I don't know where it is the program. You know, uh, uh, the title of your presentation, please. Uh, dear Professor UNESCO, uh, thank you very much for for uh, such a brilliant presentation. Um, indeed, um, my, my study and my research uh, is focused uh, on uh, Poland and Ukraine. And um, recently I've published uh, some, some pieces uh, devoted to Russia's foreign policy uh, uh, regarding Ukraine. Um, in fact, uh, what I'm interested in um, uh, was... Uh, uh, one of the questions I passed uh, in my research uh, was um, how the memory politics, what uh, role does it play in, in uh, foreign policy uh, strategy and tactics? Uh, and and, and uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not a, a simple question because uh, during the the last uh, several years, uh, lots of big conferences uh, uh, were organized uh, in order uh, in order to to uh, gather well-known uh, experts in this field, and uh, this is something that uh, draws attention around the world. And uh, um, I I actually uh when i look at at all those studies published um on disinformation and and in in memory politics i really wonder uh, i really ask myself one one question whether disinformation has uh, limits uh in fact uh, i i i uh, i would like to just um is it uh, the title okay, of your... my presentation. So the title of my presentation is Revealing the Limits of Disinformation Memory Politics. Uh, not that many people, uh, not, that many, uh, not, not that many analysts uh, believe that uh, disinformation uh, does have limits. Uh, in fact, disinformation is something that can be disseminated all around the world in different languages. Uh, via uh, different uh, social media, television, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think that uh, we have to start, if we really want to uh, uh, figure out how, uh, to find out how, the, uh, how, how this phenomena, the disinformation memory policy can be tackled, um, we have to find their limits. And I believe that every uh, natural phenomena has its limits and this information as well. Uh, so, so, so in fact, um, uh, we can find uh, within the European uh, institutions, lots of documents that contain some uh, statements uh, that, well, this information is unlimited and, and uh, uh, it, it's rather difficult uh, to, to uh, to block it, to find uh, ways uh, how to uh, counteract uh, in, uh, within the aggressive disinformation campaign. Uh, let alone just one of the latest uh, documents, this is the study, Disinformation Propaganda. Uh, it is published, it is still, uh, you can find it in European Parliament webpage. 
uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, there 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 are seven authors, and this is a rather thick uh, document uh, which states that uh, in fact uh, the the um, disinformation and propaganda uh, has uh, an advantage: unpredictability, unpredictability of uh, logic, and it's difficult to tackle all the. Uh, logical mistakes because there are so many, so it's it's uh, it, it, there is insufficient time to uh, and and time is our greatest resource and so it isn't it's it's also insufficient time. There's a there's a lack of time, the deficit of time to to react on every question, every point, every mistake, every uh, statement that uh, distorts uh, history, distorts the the. Uh, uh, collective memories and so on and so forth and um, there, there are lots of them but still I, uh, I insist that well propaganda and uh, disinformation they, they, um, they do have uh, limits and, and the international academic uh, and research community uh, have to spend some time at least uh, uh, in order to try to find those limits and uh, in my brief presentation, I would like to uh, draw uh, some, some, some uh, blueprints, some uh, draft uh, limits uh, for disinformation. And I would appreciate your reaction uh, on, on, uh, on, on uh, the findings. So these are three um, uneasy questions uh, that uh, I was uh, thinking about. Um, the international community and politicians all around the world uh, within the last uh, uh, several decades talked a lot, uh, debated a lot about the need to uh, reunify the two Koreas, but uh, the process of reunification uh, is still there and there is no progress uh, in, in uh, rapprochement between the two Koreas. And uh, the, what, what's the main obstacle to it, actually? Um, and one of, uh, one of the answer, uh, answers, I mean, just imagine what uh, would have happened if those two careers would be reunified in the end, eventually. Uh, well, the Northern careers, guided by their actually... Uh, uh, stereotypes and 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 uh, their um, perception of the uh, uh, of, of the reality, they would access the democratic institutions like elections, and they would elect uh, their another uh, the next uh, leader, uh, Kim type leader, who would continue to lead them to the brightest communist future, actually. So uh, instead of, of one Northern uh, communist and uh, totalitarian North Korea, the international community would get one big totalitarian Korea. So uh, this is the, the, the scenario that politicians, uh, they, they, they are very serious about it. And that is why they believe that uh, this inertia of thinking of the Northern Koreas, this inability to, uh, to, to, to uh, change the minds of the Northern Koreans uh, immediately uh, would hamper the whole process of political uh, rapprochement between the two Koreas. So this, it means that the disinformation and information campaigns, they do have limits. Actually, we can see it on the example of Russia. In the end of, uh, the, the, so the history of the Soviet Union, right? Uh, uh, just, uh, well, this, uh, several years uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed, a new young leader uh, came to, to, uh, to lead uh, the, 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 the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. He was uh, relatively uh, young political leader and he believed he could change the, uh, the Soviet Union in terms of the Soviet uh, society, I uh, wouldn't like to elaborate uh, um, 
a lot about the reasons why he decided uh, to, 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 to change the society, but still uh, his rhetoric uh, was a little bit different uh, in comparison to uh, uh, the one of his predecessors. Um, he, um, in, reality, he, in reality, he didn't want to, uh, to build market economy. He didn't want to build uh, a Western type uh, consolidated democracy. He didn't even want uh, to stop to 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 to, uh, um, to to stop the the, uh, the 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 Cold War. In fact, he wanted to make a pause in the uh, global context for for uh, influence around the world. Um, but um, he started a new narrative regarding the West because uh, his predecessors criticized uh, the West. He criticized the Western uh, way of life, uh, Western standards. Uh, and at the same time, uh, he of course continued, uh, Gorbachev of course continued uh, cr criticizing and, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 Western way, the Western way of life. But at the same time, um, he uh, met regularly with the Western leaders, with uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and George Bush, uh, and, and uh, they shook hands. And this uh, was something that broadcasted on TV. And uh, the Soviet government uh, began to change their official narrative uh, in history. And it was very difficult to, to change uh, to the, the, the official attitude on such issues like uh, cutting massacre and uh, the, uh, all the terror, the red terror uh, happened in 1930s, in the end of 1930s, uh, the repressions and so on and so forth. But it's still Gorbachev started, under Gorbachev, this process started. Um, unfortunately, uh, this task uh, hadn't been accomplished and uh, the new Russian authorities, Yeltsin and his team, uh, failed to build a new democratic type uh, of society in Russia. They preferred not to change those attitudes or old Soviet attitudes, uh, but uh, in, in, instead uh, they uh, uh, used those stereotypes and mass inertia of thinking of, this, of the Russian society to uh, legitimize their power. So to stay in power as long as possible. Uh, and another uh, question. So um, it is uh, um, a partly similar question. Uh, why was it so difficult for the German government to overcome inertia in perception of Eastern Germans? Why well, it was very difficult to uh, to, to uh, build consolidated, new consolidated German society uh, after the, the year of 1990, because um, the perception and the attitudes of the Eastern Germans was, and in uh, some cases, even today, we can see that uh, um, those attitudes remain different in comparison to the Western Germans. And um, uh, if, if, if you ask me, I would like to, we, we don't have much time to, to go deeper with all three of those cases. I'd like to propose you to switch to the Russian case. So um, uh, after Gorbachev's uh, perestroika, actually uh, the society, um, in fact, we may, we, we, may, we may say that the overall attitude towards the West and uh, uh, toward the Western-like changes um, introduced by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, we can, can see that uh, the, these attitudes, they began to improve. Uh, according to the opinion poll conducted by Tsiom in March 1991, uh, the, it was an opinion poll where uh, respondents might uh, choose in favor of many answers. That is why you can see that uh, if, if you sum up 68, 44, and 42, uh, then you, you cannot get 100. So uh, it means that the, the, the respondents uh, had uh, an opportunity to, to opt for 
uh, multiple answers. So 68% of respondents believe that USSR should uh, follow the path of developing or developed Western state, uh, like to, to follow the Western, like to, to start building Western like Western type of, of democracy. At the same time, 44%. Uh, uh, believe that, uh, well, the, the Soviet Union has its own way of development, its own path, um, different uh, in comparison to the West. And 42% of population believe that uh, the, the, the Earth, I mean, the civilization has a common way of development, so a philosophical uh, type of answer. Um, it, it means that Gorbachev, despite uh, his publicly expressed sympathies uh, with the West, uh, he failed to change uh, the overall attitudes toward the West, and he failed to build a new, uh, uh, a, a, a new, a, a new, uh, like uh, um, a new type of perception, a new type of attitudes. Um, at the same time, uh, we, we, uh, other questions just confirm this, uh, this uh, hypothesis. Uh, in March 1991, there was another poll uh, conducted by XIOM and uh, approximately 22% of, of respondents were positive about uh, development of economic cooperation with the West. This, I mean, the economic cooperation with the West was the main, uh, was among the, the greatest achievements uh, of the Gorbachev era, of the Gorbachev presidency. And only 22% of Russian population, Soviet population, appreciated that. So um, it means that uh, actually uh, the population. Uh, hadn't changed their mind about the Soviet Union. They, they preferred the Soviet Union, the Soviet reality to stay with them. They wanted just to consume. They wanted, they, 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 they realized that people in the West lived better. And uh, it was a matter of uh, a single person, whether this concrete person believed that those, uh, this level of consumption is really achievable, was really achievable or not. Uh, in fact, the, 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 uh, the fact that the, the Russian society did not get more pro-Western, confirmed by another opinion poll conducted in April 92, uh, where only 16% were actually pro-Western. So 16. So of, in, 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 in July, mid, uh, uh, in mid-1992, 62% of, of, of Russians, they believed that Russia should save the status of great power if, and if it would worsen relations with other countries, with neighbors and with other great powers. So um, why? The question was why uh, uh, the, the Russian society did not draw a red line between the old Soviet Union and the new Russia the old totalitarian or authoritarian Soviet Union and new democratic Russia. Uh, why they preferred old Soviet style historical narrative. Uh, and the answer was given in my uh, humble opinion, uh, the, the correct answer was given by uh, Alexei Levinson, a, a, a uh, CEOM researcher, he told that uh, the key role here was played by the elder generation of educated layer of the Soviet Russian society. So the educated layer of the elder generation was not prepared for, uh, for, for, for changes introduced by, by, by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, but um, uh, put, it, put it in another way, uh, they they were not prepared to pay um, a very big price for 74 years of communism, for 74 years of ineffective economy. Um, actually, they, um, they were about 35, 40, 45 years uh, till 50, uh, according to Levinson. So this layer, educated layer of the elder, uh, 
generation of educated, uh, the, the elder generation of educated members of the society. They were about 35 to uh, 50 years old. Uh, they had a certain educational experience. They graduated from Soviet universities. They absorbed the Soviet ideology. They actually had uh, plans for the second part of their life. Uh, and they, of course, planned to somehow uh, um, make their lives better. But suddenly the whole system of coordinates just ruined, just disappeared. And they saw how younger compatriots were more successful in uh, uh, building careers, in starting businesses. And that is why they switched their minds they supported, initially, all of them supported, ardently supported Gorbachev's perestroika, new narrative uh, and, and the new, new priorities in, in uh, memory politics. But within just several years, they changed their mind and they preferred to stick to uh, old Soviet uh, uh, type of policies and, and uh, identity. Uh, that's what actually Levinson meant. Uh, I took this data, this is the official data of Rostat, and just, uh, 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 just uh, um, highlighted three, three biggest in number, biggest number generations of Russian society. Uh, the first one who were born right after the war, they were baby boomers. They were born in 1950s, at the beginning of 1960s. And of course, after uh, they appeared to, 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 after they were born, there was a demographic gap between, because those who had to build their families, who had to establish their families in the 1940s for, uh, uh, for, 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 for uh, well-known reasons, uh, because of the Second World War, they just had to postpone the, those processes. So this was the, 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 um, the, the, it became the reason for this demographic gap. Uh, then those who were born uh, in 1950s, they uh, actually uh, decided to build their families in, in the end of 1970s, 1980s. And this is the second biggest generation in Russia. Uh, so actually it is my generation. So they are now about uh, 35, 40, probably a little more or less years. And then the, uh, another, uh, another demographic gap followed, uh, not only because of war, but uh, because of uh, economic difficulties in 19, uh, 1980s. And uh, the third wave, it's not that big in comparison to the previous two uh, ones, but still, this is a new generation. Young, and and uh, actually, uh, the, the elder generation, the eldest generation, I would say, uh, they, uh, they, they are totally different in, in comparison to the younger generation, to my generation. Uh, they, had, uh, they had already formed and fixed a uh, way of uh, perception of, of, uh, uh, of reality. Uh, actually, um, they, 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 they use the Soviet patterns and it's very difficult to persuade them with the conventional logic. Extremely difficult. It's, it's practically impossible. It is practically impossible. And uh, Boris Yeltsin, when he came to power, he faced the uh, resistance of uh, this part of society. And he clearly understood that uh, new pro-democratic, pro-Western narrative would not bring him political scores. And he very, uh, and he immediately switched to old Soviet and probably uh, more aggressive narrative towards the West. He actually embraced some Soviet patterns regarding the, the uh, memory politics, uh, actually. Uh, it, it was not completely Soviet, no that some patterns he embraced, I mean, in terms of great power, in terms of uh, the, the actually, uh, the, the uh, uh, Katyn massacre, uh, the, 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 uh, the Katyn massacre case uh, was actually uh, hidden, uh, 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 
what, what was actually stopped. The, the whole investigation was stopped uh, actually under Boris Yeltsin. So, um, but still, the, the narrative was actually pro-Soviet because he clearly understood, he clearly understood that uh, actually, if not him, but the opposition, uh, opposition would embrace this narrative and uh, would come to power. Uh, the two generations, all the three generations, they are totally different, but the elder generation uh, has its own actually specific specificity. Uh, it, uh, uh, the main source for uh, the information uh, is TV for this, uh, for this uh, uh, layer of population. They watch news, they uh, actually construct their reality with the help of the television. So uh, the political party who controls the television has totally 100% access to their minds. Uh, Igor, yes. Igor, three three minutes, please. Three minutes, yes. No, the no, three minutes. No I have, more. Yes, I have two slides. Just uh, in, sorry uh, for very very anyway yeah, no, very no, no, very, no. very yeah. interesting. So, yes, but we so, would, we would discuss, please. Yes, yes, okay. So um, uh, the the uh, the younger generation, they they are more open. The 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 sources of information are more uh, uh, more numerous, and and they prefer social networks. They prefer internet. Uh, they have devices. And when I ask my students uh, who watch TV, TV on a regular basis, within the last uh, seven years, I uh, haven't received a single positive answer. Another factor uh, is uh, another factor, another limit of propaganda. Uh, every propaganda narrative uh, is based on uh, successful and attractive uh, uh, alternative of economic development or, or of economic standards, standards of living. According to Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, actually, uh, Russia cannot present a viable and uh, uh, successful uh, alternative to the European or Western type of consumption. Um, just uh, you can. Uh, uh, at this slide, I, I, you, you can see the, the numbers, the, the disproportion of, of uh, uh, wealth uh, distribution is enormous. So Russia in this uh, actually uh, aspect is much closer to some Latin American or even African countries, not to European. So uh, that is why uh, the disinformation and propaganda campaigns uh, of the Kremlin, they are de-ideologized the because they have nothing to propose an alternative. So finally, my, I have four points. So what are the limits for disinformation and politics might be? First, demographic structure, because the elder generations, they are not perceptive to new, alter to, to, to new narratives, to fresh narratives. They are not ready to... Uh, to, to change. The second point is that experience and skills gained during the first part of professional activity are crucial. I um, mean, if a young, if a young person uh, gained a skill of uh, critical analysis uh, at the universities, it is less perceptive to disinformation campaigns. That's true. The third point, uh, the third uh, hypothesis I would like to present is the role of intellectual is crucial. And this is why I, uh, I completely agree with Professor Ionescu and with previous speakers who were told that uh, every discussion on uh, historical topics must be started uh, in, in the, uh, within the uh, historical community. And last, in, uh, the disinformation campaign cannot uh, be uh, totally, 100% successful if it isn't based on attractive alternative to current living standards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, may I have a um, question to uh, Dr. Kretsky? from the, uh, the very beginning. Oh, I'm not sure if moderator, if. Uh, uh, okay, we, we, uh, I didn't, uh, uh, Jean-Marie, Jean, uh, Marie-Jean, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, it's, up to, uh, it's up to you to, to yes. say. I take over for managing the questions. So please send your audience sent your questions uh, to 
to the organizers so that we can forward them to our speakers. Since we haven't got any so far, let me start with the first question to Professor Riddle. And I apologize for challenging you a bit on your last uh, recommendations. You so eloquently um, described what would be necessary in terms of uh, presenting history and memory uh, politics, multi-perspectivity, no generalization, uh, no ascription of collective characteristics, and so on, which one would immediately subscribe. And then at the end of your presentation, you said that one should take into account political culture, normative structure, and tradition. And I wonder whether there isn't an inherent contradiction in, in the two statements, because in a pluralistic society, there would be probably different diversity of normative structures and traditions and understandings of um, political culture. So how would you actually determine what political culture of a country is and whose political culture and norms and traditions are in question? Oh, uh, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, uh, uh, um, I think uh, we, we, we should find uh, uh, um, equilibrity between uh, uh, between uh, the uh, 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 historical uh, narratives conducted uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, concerning in concern to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to, to this guideline also to, to obvious principles of uh, multi perspectivity. Uh, and uh, and uh, avoiding uh, generalization or determinism, uh, historical determinism uh, in, in the view of, uh, uh, of of the historical matters, uh, uh, and uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, open uh, open discussions. But uh, uh, there are uh, some limitations of. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, of um, historical uh, uh, of presentation of history, uh, uh, if, uh, do you remember uh, uh, the very uh, popular uh, film uh, *Inglorious Bastards*? Uh, it, it is a total fiction. It, it is a fantasy in cloth of uh, Second World War. Uh, it, it, it is a some, some kind dangerous uh, 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 method of uh, presentation of history. You can you can uh, uh, you can uh, show uh, uh, total fantastic uh, 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 narration. Uh, uh, very attractive, uh, but uh, totally wrong and fa fantastic. And you can you can uh, form uh, uh, through this uh, movie uh, uh, the meaning of of of, of the of the society. I, I I'm afraid it is uh, uh, it, it is the case of this film. Uh, uh, um, our uh, unsere. Mütter unserer Väter, this historical film about the second, the young Germans uh, during the Second World War. It is a, a technically a very good movie, and it earned many, uh, 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 many awards. Uh, uh, but it it it, it was a Mm -hmm. catastrophe for polish german relations <laughs> uh, so it is um, uh, um, there are uh, in fact i think uh, uh, some some uh, some limits the, the limits are uh, not easy to define uh, but 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 there are uh, limits and you in in certain situation uh, we, uh, uh, not, not we, but the, the politician or, or the, 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 
public meaning uh, 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 is convinced to uh, to create the norms uh, in, in this case uh, on this area. Uh, so I, I think it is. Um, uh, 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 of course, the, uh, it is uh, easier for, for authoritarian systems, uh, authoritarian states, uh, to uh, uh, to manipulate uh, mm, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 this, this historical narration to use that as as a, uh, as a tool. Uh, 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 but uh, how uh, uh, Nick Kuhl uh, uh, said on the first day of, of the conference, this kind of manipulation is uh, uh, never without bad consequences. It's, it comes back to, to, uh, to, to, to the authors of this manipulation. Uh, 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 so, it, uh, but the question you you uh, you said is uh, is is uh, gr great and and really complicated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I may shortly, please. Um, that is indeed a difficult issue. Well, your question was re uh, relates to, in fact, two different guidelines. So maybe that is one of the reasons why they are not so easily. Uh, easy to combine. However, it is an important issue because something that seems to be as a dif disinformation for uh, one party might be simply the knowledge or political culture or memory culture for the other. So in that case, we, we may um, use the method that was used, for example, in the German-Russian textbook, uh, which was uh, published a few years ago. And the authors from both countries could not agree on how to interpret the uh, hitler stalin Pact and the secret protocol. So they simply wrote both versions. So at least um, the readers, if it uh, gets to the readers, because that is a, a totally different issue, then at least they can see how the other party sees the, the, the same problem. Okay. May, may I may I raise another question, please? What I am thinking. I am thinking, uh, uh, Professor Riedel and Bartosz. Uh, uh, I am thinking to what uh, what had happened in USA when had appeared in New York Times in 2019. Yeah, um, the project uh, 1619, namely the first ship bringing slaves in America. And then the entire uh, uh, crisis which had followed uh, in USA concerning what about the past? So my question is, is and is concerned also with your principles, uh, which you uh, think uh, such kind of tackle with memory, we would have to uh, uh, we would have to base it. Uh, my question is. Would you think that even in democracy, not only in uh, uh, autocracy, even in democracy, we would have to be very careful how to try to change the past or to manipulate, because manipulating meaning uh, uh, changing at the social uh, dimensions, you know? Uh, if we are trying to do that, or uh, uh, according to your principle, uh, we would have to base our start on uh, the latest academic result of the past, uh, researching, researching the past. How we would have to combine that two required requirements, namely, uh, according to the latest academic research and the opinion public orientation or even political orientation because even in democracies you know that's my question are democracies able to tackle with the past in the most positive way or not Bartosz? um yes. well i think we can we cannot uh, pretend 
to, to change the past. I mean, you can't change the past, you can change its interpretations, uh, people's yes. knowledge, etc. So I wouldn't change um, uh, if, yeah, I wouldn't influence um, uh, historical debate, for example, or the the, the uh, scholarly results due to some political reasons. Um, so we can only inform people, we, we should uh, work in order to inform people about, for example, the latest research um, so that they um, uh, try to adopt these in their uh, works of art or, well, maybe not art, but in, in films, for example, in um, textbooks, etc. cetera. Um, and it should be done not because it's, uh, because there is some kind of uh, political um, um, uh, will or because politicians ask uh, scholars to do this, but be simply because we, we want to uh, get a, a high quality of uh, product, for example, textbook. However, there is, of course, a, a different problem. I, I was talking to a film director recently and, and described him the, the whole issue about this um, TV series, uh, Our Fathers, Our Mothers. And then he said, but that's for a film director, that's obvious. Uh, they presented the, the Polish citizens in a very negative way, not because they were against them or something, but because they wanted to uh, present their own uh, uh, citizens or characters uh, in this case in a better light. So it was, it had nothing to do with history, just the, the way you present certain characters. So if you look at it from that point of view, then of course the recent research and so on has, it has absolutely no meaning. It's, so, so it's simply, we, we need to educate people that also when they are making TV series, except for uh, the way they create a plot, they should also take into account uh, something like research or memories, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. There is another question to both of you about alternatives to your guidelines. Wouldn't it be a better idea to have a code of ethics for historians. Such a code of ethics for historians has been proposed by Anton de Beuth. So what do you think of, you know, directing your propositions more towards the historians and make sure that they work properly and, and stick to the code of, to, to, to a code of conduct? Uh, may, may I start, perhaps? Um, uh, the uh, ethics, um, ethic rules uh, uh, for historians is one, one thing. Uh, 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 the historians, um, uh, 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 it, it, and it is simply <laughs> uh, uh, the proper work of historian is ethic. <laughs> uh, uh, if you have a, uh, if you use proper methods of, of research, uh, a proper uh, 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 footnote and, and so on and so on, and, and bibliography, and you don't uh, plug yet uh, the other authors, uh, your work is uh, 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 correct, uh, ethically too, uh, 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 but uh, the uh, problem be begins uh, uh, but the, uh, by the uh, uh, transmission of uh, knowledge, his pure scientific historical knowledge to uh, uh, to the uh, to the public. Uh, it, uh, it it used the instruments of film of uh, exhibitions uh, uh, and so on and so on. And in this uh, uh, situation of transfer. Uh, occur, in my opinion, most uh, uh, mistakes or manipulations. Uh, you, you understand, you can uh, 
uh, I, I saw that with my own eyes uh, on many exhibitions or, or, or uh, uh, so to say, Gedenkstätten, uh, uh, um, I, I, I don't know the, 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 the English meaning for this um, thing. Uh, imagine you have a good written narration for an exhibition. But you, uh, but you, for one uh, uh, person or one uh, uh, historical event, you use very impressive, uh, great photographs, very dramatically uh, dr dr uh, impressive photographs, and for for the other uh, 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 event, you use smaller uh, uh, and and uh, not so interesting uh, uh, photographs, and you you may in this way. Uh, you change the uh, uh, the whole please perception perception yes it is the right word uh, 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 perception of of these things so I I think we speak about two different uh, uh, fields of activities uh, 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 of acting with history. Uh, one is the science. Uh, it's uh, easy to, 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 to control and easy to, uh, uh, mostly easy to control, to, 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 to evaluate, and uh, the uh, uh, transmission of historical knowledge to, to the public. And it, this is not so easy to evaluate. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one last question. Yes, Bartosz. Okay, uh, I, I had a question, of course, from Mr. Gretzky. Um, uh, you mentioned that the survey of March 1991 was very positive, it was pro-European and, and so on. But then in uh, the July 1992, it was pretty much negative, nostalgic, etc. cetera. Um, but then there was a very important event that took place in between, that is the uh, the end of the Soviet Union in December 91. So did this influence, I don't like the what ifs questions, but um, the, the, it, you, you start thinking what would be the, mm, the uh, polls or surveys if the Soviet Union would last longer and just the reforms would be introduced, which would be of course dramatic for the Baltic states say. Oh, uh... Thank you for the question. Uh, me neither. Uh, I don't like to, to uh, go on with these ifs. Uh, however, uh, if, if the Soviet Union uh, wouldn't have collapsed uh, in, in the end of 1999, I don't think that, uh, I, I believe it would be even better because it would be the Soviet Union who would pay the price for the 70 year 74 year period of ineffective uh, of, of ineffective uh, economy of repressions it would be it would have been the Soviet Union who to blame not uh, Yeltsin or so-called Democrats who just ruined the, the Soviet legacy the Soviet uh, uh, economic system that worked well relatively well uh, how, how the elder generation believed uh, they, 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 they do believe that uh, it performed well uh, because uh, in the previous within the previous system of coordinates they felt uh, secure uh, they felt um, they uh, had uh, actually jobs uh, and they had prospects for the future a new system of coordinates within the market economy, uh, they, uh, they had nothing of the three. So um, I really believe that um, Gorbachev would have failed uh, to um, transform successfully uh, the Soviet economy, uh, would have failed to build democratic society. And uh, actually the outcomes of those polls uh, would have been the same. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes our last panel. Thank you very much to our speakers and discussants, moderators, 
I hand over the floor to Baltar for concluding remarks. Yes, thank you very much. But Mr. Ionescu should uh, introduce uh, Bartosz. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have to present Mr. Bartosz because I have missed uh, his presentation. So uh, he has worked for the Center for Historical Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Berlin for uh, four years, between 2012 and up to 2016. Since 2016, he has been researcher and deputy head of the academic department. Uh, it's okay. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. At the academic department at the Institute of European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, and also a researcher at the History Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. Fields of interest and research, Polish-German relations, textbooks, Polish foreign policy of memory and cultural diplomacy. Recently, he published To Acquire the Right Place Among the Nation, Cultural Diplomacy and the New Order in East Central Europe, uh, uh, each, uh, which uh, uh, is a book uh, being um, uh, published uh, together with Jay Winter. Uh, it's a, a compendium, I would say, also at Rutledge, would, uh, uh, under the title A New Europe between 1918 up to 1923, Instability, uh, Innovation and uh, Recovery, which would uh, uh, appear this year. And also uh, he has uh, a study in uh, already uh, mentioned uh, Jan Rieder Stefan Probst uh, um, book, uh, Overcoming Conflict Memories, History in the Polish-German Relations after 1989. As a matter of fact, history would continue to represent a very important uh, tool in diplomacy, politics, and uh, as uh, uh, our Russian uh, colleague had uh, already uh, told us in this information uh, uh, field. Thank you so much. Now it's up to you, Bartosz. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ionescu. Uh, now, during the last three days, we have listened to over 40 experts, among them historians, political scientists, sociologists, and practitioners speaking about case studies of disinformation mainly uh, history related about the methods and techniques of disinformation today, especially the role of mass media and above all, um, and social media and above all methods of combating disinformation. Um, and in my closing remarks, I'll try to sum up this conference briefly. Um, there were various topics and approaches presented. So in the, these uh, uh, remarks, I will just point to some issues, which in my opinion were of particular importance. Um, disinformation and propaganda are aimed to distort, distract and disrupt. Uh, and to a vast extent, they are aimed at the, um, I think I can say it, uh, Western democracies and the free world. Um, not that there is no disinformation within so-called free world, that's another story. It affects basically all possible fields of life. However, we are mainly touching upon history and memory. These spheres are extremely vulnerable as both history and memory are strictly connected with identity and emotions as many speakers have underlined. Therefore, disinformation can so easily feed on them. Thus, we can speak about weaponization of emotions. Moreover, history is a crucial element in creating images of countries and is used to build authority of various regimes. And that's, uh, it has been used like that since centuries. Therefore, we can find such lies as, for example, the Russian propaganda blaming Poland, that is the first victim of the Second World War, for causing it, actually. Thus, Kremlin tries to... Um, cover the blameworthy secret protocol of the Hitler-Stalin pact. A number of uh, papers showed how Russia adopts fake news related to history in its diplomacy and media, often drawing from KGB methods as Ivo Yurda proved. 
uh, Maria Snegovaya, on the other hand, underlined that there is connection between historical disinformation spread by the Kremlin in Central Eastern Europe and the rising popularity of political pro-Kremlin movements, which harness the Eurosceptic sentiment in the region. Past is so important for Russia that it even wrote history into its national security strategy, which, by the way, is something that the Western democracies could actually take into consideration and learn from. However, as Nicholas Kahl underlined, we cannot speak about neutral or positive propaganda. It is always negative, no matter who does it. There are also other reasons why disinformation is a growing problem. There is overabundance of information that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance. One can therefore speak about infodem. We must remember that it is very up to date that there are uh, numerous conspiracy theories adopted against vaccinations. And people are especially prone to it during times of crisis and when there is distrust in institutions and allies. Today, we have obviously one more factor that is the social media which enable taking so-called active measures by various agents responsible for disinformation and have huge impact on the society. Um, here, as uh, uh, Joel Breakstone pointed out, education is one of the best methods to combat disinformation. And today, um, uh, Dr. Kaminsky said that um, general historical knowledge is a vaccine uh, against uh, disinformation. A study uh, which was conducted at Stanford, uh, Dr. Braxton uh, was speaking about it yesterday, uh, showed that students, but also actually historians, were poorly equipped to evaluate the trustworthiness of internet sources. Therefore, it is so important to teach how to distinguish truth and lies. Um, of course, remembering that Truth has also various interpretations, which makes it even more difficult. Um, and this critical thinking might also help no to disinformation learning package for secondary schools that we prepared at the NRS, I'll say Pro Domo Sua. It familiarizes students with past and contemporary disinformation campaigns and shows them how to verify information independently. Thanks to education, People will be more immune to using history-related fake news, for example, to using Holocaust or Auschwitz in social media propaganda, as um, uh, Professor Bargano uh, showed us yesterday. This brings me to the next issue touched upon during the conference, the importance of, and role of the experts. In case of history-related disinformation, it is the duty of professional historians to react. There is a pressing need for the experts to involve in the public debate. As Aldrich Tuma said, I'm quoting, it might not be the historian's task to find the ultimate truth, but they can help to detect the ultimate lies in the public space, end of quote. It is important that their knowledge is translated into the language of mainstream media. It is not enough that uh, we will write uh, dozens of pages of scholarly works whom our fellow historians will read and no one else. So uh, we can, so I can simply make an appeal to other historians and experts to uh, write uh, and to talk to various media as much as possible to popularize their, um, our knowledge. Um, and here we come to the role of media. This issue was brought up in several papers and discussions, also in relation to the freedom of speech. There is a clear tension. On the one hand, we can observe um, growing authoritarian and anti-democratic tendencies in Europe and beyond. So freedom of speech obviously must be defended. But on the other hand, um, other authoritarian states and agents of disinformation uh, use the Western freedom of speech uh, to spread fake news. Um, here, Nicholas Kahl proposed disarmament of media with the means of traditional di diplomacy so that uh, politicians would sit down simply at a round table and talk about how they use propaganda through media. Uh, and just in, as in the 1980s uh, between the USSR and the USA, they sh maybe should try to um, 
limit the use of propaganda, uh, which of course might be difficult, but they can try. Um, 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 now, of course, we cannot prevent uh, disinformation in, in, in total, but uh, speakers propose various remedies. Like for instance, um, we should ask basic questions just as we the historians learn during our studies, uh, also to, in the relation to medieval sources. Who's the author? Uh, what's the aim of the particular source uh, uh, information and so on? Um, we should also uh, use something that I personally and probably all other historians as well learn during our studies, that is, do not take the written word for granted, no matter where it is written and through which uh, media. Then also uh, we should discredit and debunk disinformation using uh, focusing on narratives and not specific cases. Um, Moreover, uh, amplify debunking by, but concentrate on a few obviously false statements. Uh, uh, more is not better, um, as Todd Leventhal said yesterday. Come up with your own catchy narratives, the ones which would hopefully show truth. Mm, avoid polarization, build trust, engage mainstream media, which of course is difficult because the mainstream media is all, are also divided between various political um, uh, views, uh, parties, etc. Um, target influential elites so that um, people who uh, uh, have thousands of followers uh, also get your message. Mm, and above all, look why actually people believe fake news, right? Um, then also there are a number of uh, institutional and legal uh, tools which can be implemented as uh, uh, Mr. Cesarini showed us today. Summing, su summing up, there is a long way ahead of us, but I hope that together with our conference, we can make at least a small step towards combating disinformation. And as a representative of the European Network Remembrance of Solidarity, one of the three organizers of the conference, I'd like to thank the other two institutions uh, which organized the conference. That is the College of Communication and Public Relations at the Uni uh, National University of Political Studies and Public Administration in Bucharest, as well as the National Institute for the Study of Tot Totalitarianism at the Romanian Academy of Sciences, and especially Professor Florin Abraham, who was the Spiritus Movens of the conference. Thank you, Florin. I'd also like to thank the conference team from the European Network, Remembrance and Solidarity, and of course, our wonderful speakers and audience, which was asking questions. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.